Good afternoon, we're calling this meeting to order. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Council Member Diana Ayala, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. I'd like to thank my colleagues, Council Member Margaret Chen, Chair of the Committee on Aging, and Council Member Idanis Rodriguez, Chair of the Committee on Transportation, for co-chairing this hearing with me today. This afternoon, we are here to identify the challenges and explore some possible solutions to better meet the transportation needs of individuals with disabilities who live and work and visit New York City. Nearly one million New Yorkers self-identify as individuals living with a disability. Additionally, New York City's population is aging. The city's total older adult population increased from 1.25 million in 2000 to 1.73 million in 2017, with a significant portion of the senior community affected by disabilities or challenges with mobility. Also, of the 62.8 million visitors to New York City in 2017, seven million of those visitors were individuals with a disability. Still, despite the significant number of New Yorkers with disabilities and mobility challenges, transportation is deeply inaccessible, with less than one quarter of subway stations having elevators, inadequate subway um, sidewalk curb cuts, and not enough accessible taxis and for hire vehicles. This hearing will allow the committee and the public to examine the crucial role Accessoride plays in providing transportation services for individuals with disabilities so they can travel safely and with dignity. For those subway stations that do not have elevators, old infrastructure and a chronic lack of investment in repairs uh, has meant that elevators and subway stations break down an average of 53 times per year. According to the Mayor's Office for, Pe for People with Disability annual, um, annual report, only 87 key subway stations of the 472 subway stations are fully accessible under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Despite these continuing historic issues, we are hopeful for a more accessible city in the future. We are enthusiastic about the recent changes that the MTA has announced with regard to making New York City a more accessible city, including enhanced sensitivity training for all MTA employees, more direct routes for Accessor Ride, 50 plus new accessible stations within five years so that all subway riders are no more than two stops from an accessible station, and better information on elevator outage and alternate routes, and an accessibility advisor who reports directly to the president of the MTA. Additionally, we are very excited that the MTA has hired its first ever first um, senior advisor for system-wide accessibility, Alex Alug Alugirin. Sorry, Alex. And we greatly look forward to hearing from him today. I want to thank the MTA and the advocates here today for the commitment that they have made to ensure Accessor Ride remains a priority and is truly accessible for all. I look forward to hearing more about all of the work being done and the role of the City Council can play in supporting those efforts. I also want to thank my colleagues, Council Member Chin, Council Member Rodriguez and their staff, as well as committee, uh, my committee staff, Senior Council Sarah List, Policy Analyst Christy Dwyer, Finance Analyst Lauren Hunt, and my Deputy Chief of Staff and Legislative Director Bianca Almedina, and Chief of Staff Luisa um, Lopez for making this hearing possible. I also want to recognize Council Member Debbie Rose and Council Member Holden. Um, we will now pass this over to Council Member Chen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging, and I thank you for joining us today, uh, triple joint oversight hearing with the Committee on Mental Health, Disability, and Addiction, and the Committee on Transportation on Accessori. I also want to thank Chair Ayala and Chair Rodriguez for co-chairing this hearing today. New York City's paratransit system, Accessori, is a vital mode of transportation for many of our city's senior and other individuals with disabilities. These individuals rely on Accessori to take them to doctor's appointment, to go grocery shopping, to engage in social activities, and to complete many other activities daily. Unfortunately, for years, Accessori has proven itself to be unreliable. We've heard many horror stories about Accessori. We have heard stories about passengers missing vital doctor's appointment because Accessori was late. We have heard stories about passengers waiting in freezing temperature for an Accessori that never showed up. We've heard complaints about driver lacking training 
on how to work with individuals with disability and driver taking meandering routes that take passenger hours to reach a destination. It's no surprise that some are calling accessory stressory. <laughs> Today's hearing will provide an opportunity for the committees to hear firsthand from our city's seniors and persons with disabilities about their experience with Accessori. We want to hear about the challenges our Accessori users have faced and hear their recommendation for improvements. Importantly, we want to hear what MTA plan to do about it. From, from MTA, we want to hear why Accessori is so unreliable and what plans the agency has to improve services for seniors and those with disabilities. Everyone deserves fast and reliable transportation. For many, using Accessori is the only way to get around the city. We must listen and fix this service. We cannot continue failing our seniors and those with disability. I'd like to thank the committee staff for helping and putting together this hearing. Our counsel, Nusa Chaudhary, our policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, finance analyst, Daniel Koop, and finance unit head, Johini Sapura. And I'd also like to thank my deputy chief of staff, Marion Guerra. Um, and now I'd like to turn the floor back over to my co-chair, council member Ayala. Thank you. We will now hear from Councilmember Rodriguez. Thank you. Our committee of transportation has, as you know, been working with all the advocates, addressing anything that we need to do to make our street, our transportation accessible and affordable. It's an honor to be here with Councilmember Ayala, Councilmember Sheen from both committee that they do a great job. You know, I can say we want Monday to MTA. Let's maintain and expand assessor right. This should not be the choice. This is about human rights. Unless someone is sitting in the wheelchair and unless someone have experienced the challenges of one million New Yorkers with physical challenges. You don't have authority to come and speak against a program that is so critical and needed. And the city of New York play an important role to get congestion price. And even though I was not an MTA board meeting today, but I was following all the public section and when I heard some people saying, well, the focus should be now only on fixing the train. Yes, everyone wants to fix the train. But only 24% of the train station are accessible. So, you know, we have a great opportunity to maintain, to learn from the pilot project, to see how it work, to see how we can be better but not reducing, not putting a cap of $15 an hour, not reducing to 16 a month. You know, if someone need five or 10, great. But if someone need to use the assessor ride 30 times a year, a, a month, or whatever number they need it, we should not have any cap. And I think that, you know, when we were negotiating and we were throwing our support to congestion price. We were clear to the governor, we were clear to the MTA leadership, and we know that we had to, those of us who are, you know, representing agency and entity, we just have to, your role is to follow all the leadership on the top. And you're gonna be explaining to us why, you know, this program you know, should put a cap, why this program should have a cap on the numbers a month, the, the cap of the dollars of $15. We are here to say the city of New York, as you know, all, you are New York too, so we don't have to persuade you, you know, on this. The city of New York contribute more than what we got from the state and from the federal government. So 
congestion price funding will be mainly used to fix our train. But also we were clear to them that some of those money also should be used to programs that are critical for, uh, to move our New Yorkers. So as a chairman of the Committee of Transportation, as a colleague together with the chair of the other two committee, we are here to ask the MTA, but most important to ask the governor and his governmental relation that oversee the MTA and the chair of the MTA, to ask the mayor to fight with us, to ask everyone on the public and private sector to please let's raise our voice. Most stations here are not accessible. Our New Yorkers that deal with health issues, the New Yorkers that are close to one million that have physical challenges, need access right as an option. They will continue using the trains, they will continue using the buses, they will continue using the ferry, but they also need to have accessories as an option that no one should take away from them. So with that, thank you and cheers and let's, you know, work together. Thank you, Council Member. We've also been joined by Council Members Espinal, Ampri Samuel, Reynoso, Valone, and Menchaca. Um, the committee staff, council will now administer the affirmation. This is for anyone who's testifying or answering questions. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You can begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Ayala, Chairperson Chin, Chairperson Rodriguez, and members of the Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction, Aging, and Transportation Committees. And good afternoon to our paratransit customers and advocates in the room. I would like to thank you for this opportunity to discuss Accessoride. I am Craig Cipriano, the Acting President of MTA Bus Company, Senior Vice President of New York City Transit Bus. I'm joined here today, on my left here, by Vice President Michael Cosgrove, Vice President of Paratransit, and to my right, Alex Elagudin, Senior Advisor for System-Wide Accessibility. I manage the MTA's bus and paratransit operations. Mike manages the day-to-day -day operations of the paratransit program, and we work closely with Alex, who is the first ever senior advisor for system-wide accessibility and a valued colleague and partner in shaping our vision for paratransit as we look to the future. New York City Transit's fast-forward plan is intended to modernize every aspect of our operations. A key aspect of the plan is to expedite work to make the transit system fully accessible as quickly as possible. To this end, Alex has assembled a world-class team that is laser-focused on making our vision a reality. As you know, we're investing an unprecedented $5.2 billion to add 70 new accessible stations to the subway system, more than meeting our goal that no customer is ever more than two stations away from an accessible station. Paratransit service is provided for people who meet the eligibility criteria set forth in the American Disabilities Act of 1990. It's important to note our service today goes above and beyond the requirements set forth in the ADA. ADA requirements include origin to destination and door-to-door -door service where needed. Next day reservations, no restrictions on trip purpose, and zero denials. To give you some background on the New York City Accessorite system, our paratransit service is the largest in North America performing over 8 million trips a year. We have 160,000 registrants with approximately 68,000 active New Yorkers in any given month. This month, we reached a peak of 33,700 trips scheduled in a single day, our highest number ever. 71% of registrants are over 65 years of age and 15% use a wheelchair. And this year's budget for paratransit was $614 million. The MTA assumed responsibility for providing paratransit service under the 1993 agreement with the city. There is a partial annual subsidy from the city, which amounts to the lesser of one-third of the MTA's net paratransit operating expenses, or 20% increase over the subsidy paid by the city in the prior year. Since taking over the program, paratransit ridership has seen a six-fold increase in registrants, from 25,000 to more than 160,000, and the total number of trips has increased 1,900% since 1994. 
Both registrants and ridership are only expected to continue to increase in 2020 and beyond. Although the ADA allows agencies to charge up to double the base fare for paratransit service, based on the 1993 agreement with the city, our paratransit customers pay the standard base fare. This is an important note when thinking about the budgetary aspects you will hear from us later on today. As a result, our net operating deficit has risen from $11 million in 1994 to $548 million today. Of that, the city will pay only $176.4 million, leaving us with the remaining balance of $371.9 million, which is twice as much as the city's share. The reality is that the city's contribution to paratransit's net operating expenses has not kept pace with the growth in demand and accelerated investments in service. Given our current financial outlook, it is no longer sustainable for the MTA to shoulder a disproportionately high share of the operating expenses. We believe that an equal 50% share of the cost is fair. As you may know, in many jurisdictions across New York, the locality covers the full amount of paratransit costs, and in other cities, dedicated taxes have been appropriated to help share this expense. I want to take a moment to highlight how we've gotten to where we are today and how we have improved our services to facilitate the type of growth we are seeing. Over the last three years in particular, we've made great strides as part of our fast forward plan. We simplified the registration application and improved the eligibility process by reducing reassessments. The no-show late cancellation policy was updated and simplified. In 2019, we've introduced 700 new dedicated service vehicles to replace older vehicles approaching the end of their service life. Customers can now take advantage of improved GPS tracking to follow their trips on the My AAR app and webpage. Thanks to a collaborative effort with advocates and our partners at New York City Department of Transportation, dedicated carrier vehicles now have access to bus lanes. We launched an on-demand e-hail pilot and we will be doubling the pool of participants as part of the next phase in early 2020. To increase transparency, we're now regularly publishing performance metrics on our public dashboard found on the MTA website. We've also introduced a customer bill of rights and instituted improvements for driver training. Lastly, there's also a new scheduling, dispatching, and AVLM system in development. These changes have led to significant improvements in service and the numbers speak for themselves. Since this time last year, on-time performance for primary carrier pickup within the 30-minute window is up to 97%. Broker pickup on-time performance within that same window is up to 96%. Average trip duration is down seven minutes from last year to 37 minutes in October of 2019. Primary carrier no-shows are down to less than one per thousand scheduled trips in October of 2019 compared to two per thousand in October of 2018. Broker no-shows are also down to less than one per thousand over that same period. Our customers have also been telling us that they're satisfied with the service. In our latest customer satisfaction survey, 89% of respondents said they were satisfied with their most recent AAR trip. This is an increase of 24 percentage points when compared to two years prior. Along with customer service, the MTA has also prioritized financial responsibility in paratransit with reforms dating back to 2017. These include leveraging fixed route services by introducing feeder service and a free fare metro card, reviewing contracts to find potential cost savings. In 2010, this yielded savings of $83.4 million over a 10 year period. In our 2013 to 2015 carrier reviews, we found another $31 million in annual recurring savings. And in 2019, efforts to cut costs across the entire MTA yielded 14.7 million over those two years. We're fully leveraging our ability to perform AAR trips and taxis and for hire vehicles, which have a lower cost per trip than the dedicated vehicles, in cases where such services meet our customers' demands or customers' needs. In the last several years, we've shifted service being performed by dedicated carrier vehicles from 70% down to 40%. 60% of trips are now being performed by taxis and for hire vehicles, leading to 33.2 million in recurring annual savings. We've also reviewed schedules to improve dedicated carrier productivity. While, been, while we have been laser focused on cost containment measures, 
The substantial investments we've made in paratransit, along with the service improvements, have, has led to a boom in ridership. Since 2017 alone, we have seen a 7% increase in customer growth, a 31% increase in trips, and a 29% increase in the budget. This shows no signs of slowing down. In fact, when we look at the overall demographics of the city, there is a much larger population of potentially eligible customers, including 1.1 million persons with disabilities and another 1.1 million that are over the age of 65. With that, I'd like to hand it off to Alex Elagudin to take over the next portion of our testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Sorry, got it. Thank you, Craig, and, and thank you everyone who's uh, here today and for having us here today. As Craig mentioned, we're working on numerous efforts to improve paratransit service for our customers. There is no silver bullet solution when it comes to paratransit. So we are taking a multi-pronged approach to create a more flexible, responsive service that's based on a vehicle mix that best serves our customers and that the MTA can manage responsibly and sustainably. Also, as Craig mentioned earlier, we are fully committed to expanding the availability of taxis and for hire vehicles to take trips where it makes sense for our customers. We have heard loud and clear from many who say that they prefer to travel by taxi and that they enjoy the efficiency and potential flexibility that this mode offers. That's why earlier this year, we launched our enhanced broker service. We now offer fully ADA compliant service with a high level of driver training and customer assistance. Customers can book their trips on the app or website and track their vehicles as it arrives. While we face some challenges over the summer, we have transitioned to this new program. We are confident we have reached a milestone in terms of enhanced broker service. We are doing approximately 18,000 trips on an average, on an average weekday with on-time performance in the mid-90 percentile. We also have added a new broker to provide service on Staten Island, bringing parity and service across the city. The brokers are adding more wheelchair accessible vehicles to their fleets and continuing to train more drivers with the skills needed to successfully perform accessoride trips. Overall, we see this transition as a way to make taxi and for hire vehicle trips an even more integral part of our service mix. We believe that this modal shift is responsive to our customers' feedback and needs. About 60% of our trips are currently carried out through broker service. And we, we intend to grow this number even more in the future coming months and, and potentially years. This is yet another of our strategic cost containment efforts, which Craig spoke to a few minutes ago, as well as an effort to improve customer service. The average broker trip costs about $34, while the same trip would cost about $85 on dedicated carrier. This modal shift represents significant potential savings over time, as we work to right-size our dedicated carrier fleet. We continue to work closely with our partners at the TLC to educate drivers and the industry around the program and the important opportunity it provides for the taxi industry. Of course, moving trips to taxi is only one part of the equation. We are working on many ways to improve our dedicated carrier service, which remains an integral element of our system and a mode that will always be needed by a significant portion of our customers who require various levels of, a, of accessibility and assistance. It not only serves some of our customers who can't use taxis or FHVs, but helps us to meet our zero denial mandate set by the ADA. We know that at times paratransit customers' travel needs may change, and they cannot plan this in advance. We are looking at options to offer this kind of flexibility and make trips faster for everyone involved through our existing modes, including broker. We will have more on that in the future, but know that we hear our customers and their representatives here today and share the goal of building a more flexible system. Of course, the on-demand pilot program represents the greatest, possibility flex uh, uh, greatest possible flexibility we could offer. Through this pilot, which has been running for about two years, 1,200 of our customers can book trips at any time using a smartphone app. Although this service has re received rave reviews, we are still studying how to best implement it and its capacity to serve a greater portion of the Accessoride customer base. Throughout the pilot, we have seen previously low-use paratransit customers become high users, and previously high users taking even more trips, sometimes more than 100 trips per month. 
Our experience to date is that some mall users have increased their trips tenfold, some medium users have doubled their trips, and some high users have increased their trips by 30%. While we are glad to see our customers using this service, we are also closely monitoring the cost of the program. As I announced to our board last month, we will be expanding the pilot to 2,400 participants in early 2020. with new parameters in the form of caps and subsidies designed to make the program more sustainable. Customers will be uh, able to take up to 16 on-demand trips each month with a subsidy of $15 per trip. This model is consistent with the structure of on-demand service in peer cities like Boston and Chicago, and we believe it is a good start for the next phase of the pilot. Of course, Accessoride customers will continue to have unlimited access to our traditional ADA compliant paratrans paratransit service. The zero denial mandate uh, remains a core tenant of our service. The on-demand service will provide another option for participating customers to take truly spontaneous trips or adjust when plans change. We hear our customers when they say how life-changing the on-demand service has been for them, but it's important to note that we view eHail as another type of service for paratransit, not a replacement for traditional service. Our own data shows us clearly that customers need different service modes. Even on-demand pilot customers still take trips on our primary carrier service, and we have an obligation to continue providing these options. We need to continue testing on-demand service to best determine how it fits into our full service picture and how we can offer this valuable service to more of our customers. It is absolutely our goal to continue to expand on-demand service in the future. We remain equally committed to all the other service improvements we have discussed today. However, to get there, we need the city to come to the table as a partner. Expanding access to on-demand service and offering more flexibility for all our customers will have a cost, and that will mean expanding our budget envelope. So we are here today in part to continue that conversation. We know all of you will be interested in seeing what we learn from the next phase of the on-demand pilot, and we are happy to share that information as we have it. City, this, uh, uh, as we have it. We appreciate all the city has done to support paratransit service to date, and we ask you to seriously consider the request from our chairman to reevaluate the 1993 cost-sharing agreement. Finally, as this discussion develops, we will continue our investment and focus on improving the user experience for all our customers, whether you, they use on-demand, broker service, dedicated carrier service, or all the above. We look forward to a continued dialogue about how we can work together as partners to provide this vital service for tens of thousands of New Yorkers, and to do so in a sustainable, responsible manner. And I just want to highlight again, as Craig has mentioned, and I am mentioning, the Accessoride program of today has made tremendous strides in service and performance over the Accessoride service of yesterday, as evidenced by the unprecedented growth we've seen and all the metrics we presented today. Yes, once in a while, you may hear a story from a constituent about a negative experience with one of our trips, but that is the exception, not the rule today. And I say that with full confidence. We are now happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Jimmy Van Barena and Mark Levine and Deutsch, Lander, Cohen, and Kuhl. Okay. So I have a couple of questions regarding the eHale program. Um, can you tell us what the average cost of an on demand, um, what the average cost of an on demand taken per pilot? participant per month, and how does that compare to those taken by on-demand through, um, through the accessory program? Yeah, hi. So the, the average cost of the on-demand trip is about uh, $37. That's the average cost. I'm not 100% sure what you're referencing to on-demand via the AAR program. Uh, that's the average cost in the AAR program. 
in the AR program. Yes. What about in the uh, through the eHale? What is the average cost of a yeah. trip? The, the the broker program is that what you're referencing? Right now we have three modes. We have the dedicated carrier, we have the broker, which are the green and yellow taxis, and we have the on-demand eHail. Those are the three the three parts of our program. And are they all similar in cost? No, no. So the so the dedicated carrier cost is about eighty five dollars, and the broker cost is in the range of thirty five to thirty seven dollars per trip. Okay. How much, how much has the pilot cost in each year since it was launched? So uh, I'm assuming you're referencing the on-demand pilot. Yes. Is that correct? Sure. So in 2018, the 1,200 uh, customers that are enrolled in the on-demand pilot uh, took about 220,000 trips, and it cost about $8 million. In 2019, the number of trips doubled. It's projected to reach uh, 400,000 trips, and, it's, and it cost uh, roughly $15 million. So, uh, I mean, it's important to note, I mean, we recognize the, uh, the flexibility and what our customers are saying, you know, the value of the on-demand, uh, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to expand it in a sustainable manner. Mm -hmm. Now, is it cheap? Is it still cheaper at that rate than the, ex the regular accessor ride rides? So, yes, the broker and the e-hail is cheaper per trip. Yes, that is right. And I just want to add something. It is on a per trip basis, it is cheaper. I mean, you hear 85, you hear 35, obviously that's cheaper. But when you look at the volume of trips and the demand that it has pushed, um, if you take our projections for if we took 1,200 customers and we made it 100,000 or 150,000, you know, the rest of the customer base, uh, it would increase uh, the cost of the program by several hundreds of millions if it was unlimited. Even if it wasn't unlimited and it was, um, you know, even if it's on what we're suggesting, which is right now the 15 trips, the 16 trips with the $15, it w still will have a cost potentially upwards of 100 to 200 million. And any higher parameters will come with higher costs. So on a per trip basis, uh, it, it very well may be, uh, uh, very well is less expensive, but to the overall program, significant, significant cost increases. So, Alex, I mean, how, how, where did you conclude that 15 was the number? Like, where did that cap come from? Uh, in terms of the 16 uh, trips per month and the $15 uh, per trip subsidy, uh, we, did an, uh, we looked at what other cities have done in terms of how uh, they've expanded uh, their on-demand programs. And you take Boston, for example. Uh, when Boston was first experimenting with this kind of on-demand service, uh, they started with, with a similar number of $15 per trip as a subsidy. Uh, they studied, they saw how it worked in their region, and now Boston has several different tiers that go up to about $40 per trip. So, how long did it take to get there? Uh, I believe Boston did that within a year and a half to two years of starting at the $15. Uh, the, 16 uh, the 16 trip number is right around the medium number of trips that we see in our pilot. So when you see the 1,200 customers, uh, the median number of customers, uh, about 50% of customers took less than 16 trips, and, and about 50% uh, uh, of customers took more than 16 trips. So 16 trips is right around uh, what, what, what we saw from a utilization number in the two years that we have the pilot right now. And the $15, again, was us kind of looking to see uh, where we could start. Again, we've always said this is just a pilot. There's absolutely uh, possibilities and opportunities to go up on both of those parameters. But we want to do it gradually and in a sustainable way because if this does expand, um, you know, too much, too far, uncontrollably, uh, we're going to have, we, we ultimately have to pay the bill. And, um, uh, our, our, the MTA's current fiscal operating crisis is something that has been, been well documented. Mm, understood. I, I just think that I, I think that the difference with Boston, and I, I mentioned this to you yesterday. I think that the difference is that they started at 15 and worked their way up, whereas in New York City, we started at you know no cap, and now rolling it back becomes you know pretty difficult. Right. Um, understandably, you know, there's a cost attributed to this, but, you know, individuals have, you know, become accustomed to using it, and um, it's very popular. It's a very popular, you know, um, way of getting around the city. Um, the MTA, so let me ask you a question. So the MTA's overall budget this year was $16 billion. 
um, accessorite budget was 614 million. That means that paratransit represents less than 4% of the MTA's overall budget. Given the significant population that relies on paratransit, do you think that that percentage should be higher? So but what I would say is that if, uh, if I use the uh, bus system as an example, right? So the bus system carries uh, 2.2 million trips a day. Um, the subway system carries uh, 6 million trips a day. Uh, the paratransit system ca does 33,000 trips a day. So actually the subsidy per trip or the amount of money that the MTA is putting towards each and every one of those customers uh, is actually the greatest on the paratransit side. Hmm. Yeah, and I, and I just want to add to what Craig is saying. I mean, it, 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 every customer, whether you're disabled or not, or however you travel, should have a, a right to the service. Even though Accessoride does 33,000, um, you know, 30,000 trips a day, give or take, uh, whereas our fixed route service does, you know, six to eight million, it, 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 shouldn't, it, it shouldn't make a difference. Everyone deserves good service. But I think that for myself, who uh, has the privilege uh, to uh, work for President Byford and oversee accessibility across all services, right? Paratransit, bus, uh, and subway. Um, it's very difficult to extrapolate that number that you're saying and just kind of say the percentage should be higher. Um, when we're focused on our subways, which is you know the major, major part of our fixed route service, we do everything that we can to make that service as, as, as effective and efficient as poss possible for customers with disabilities. Our buses, 100% wheelchair accessible, um, same thing goes. It's not really paratransit versus bus versus subway. It's about how do they all work together and how do we make it, um, how do we make it work, right? Sometimes our, our paratransit buses are taking you to our subway, and sometimes when you get off our subway, you're going to a bus, and so on and so forth. So we treat it as an intermodal model, and we don't really uh, compare the budgets in the way that you're, you're, you, you classified, but we absolutely do understand what you're saying in the way that you mentioned it. It's, it, it is the thing. I think if we had a bigger uh, financial envelope altogether, we'd love to fund more money into paratransit. We have said that. And does the MTA, um, by any chance, document where, do you have a record of, like, what, what are people using this for? Like, are they, are they using it to get to work? Are they using it for social recreational purposes? What are they using it for? So, in, in accordance with the ADA, um, we have to service all trips, mm -hmm. and the FTA has uh, suggested and very strongly noted that we should not be tracking the uses of trips. Whether you're going to a doctor, whether you're going to work, whether you're going to a Broadway show, you have access to all of our services, including paratransit, in the same way. So we generally do not track um, in any kind of meaningful way. Certainly you hear anecdotal, you know, personal stories of what people use it for. Um, but for us as an operator, wherever you want to go, we, we are here to serve. Have you considered ride share? Right share, I mean, would that reduce the cost of the program? Uh, the program is currently a shared ride service. I mean, it's yeah. not the shared ride service yeah. that people have come to know today through TNCs and Ubers and Vias and the such. Um, but um, we, we do a significant, uh, we do a good portion of our trips on our dedicated fleet that are shared, our broker service, which is shared. And um, it does provide uh, a cost savings for sure, but we, we try to, um, make sure that any sharing that we're doing doesn't throw customers too far off their trip. So it's a, it's a fine line in terms of how much sharing we can do. When you talk about, let's just say Uber, for example, and I only, only uh, know this from my days at the TLC, who's doing 200, 250,000 trips a day in New York City, that presents massive amounts of opportunity to find uh, uh, the best sharing efficiencies. We're doing about 30,000 trips a day, much smaller number, where for us to not put our customers out of the way too much, uh, we, try, we can only share so many trips, or otherwise we'd be uh, taking them all over the place and making the, the rides longer. But using, um, we're in the process of implementing a new uh, modernized scheduling and dispatching system, 
which will you know, have much more uh, accurate real-time trip optimization, real-time traffic conditions, which will, we hope will allow us to make the current shared ride experience more and also find more opportunities for sharing rides in the future using technology. When, when do the changes go into effect? Is that January 1st? Uh, you mean for the new scheduling system? Uh, the new scheduling system is currently being developed. It, it's, it has uh, several phases. I think that um, uh, I think that the for uh, it is by 2021, early to mid 2021 potentially, that uh, the system will be uh, completed in a way where customers will see benefits. There will be certain parts of the system done over the next year. Um, but they have more to do with tracking and, and GPS location of vehicles. The trip optimization portions that will give customers the better trips and better dispatching will be in 2021. Okay. I know that my colleagues have a lot of questions and there are three chairs here, so we want to be respectful of everybody's time. So I'm going to pass it over to Council Member Chen. Thank you. Um, i just going to focus on two areas. One is that in your dedicated uh, para, you know, um, paratransit, how many company or, and subcontract does Accessori contract with? So we, cur we currently, we, we had 13 subcontractors. We currently have 10 subcontractors today based upon our carrier fleet reduction efforts. So they're the, the 10 is the one that does the dedicated service? Yes, ma'am. And you, in your testimony, you were saying that by reducing that, you are saving money. Yes, a reduction in the dedicated uh, carriers do sa does save money. In fact, in 2019, based upon Mike and the team's effort, we saved $30 million on the paratransit program. So are you um, working on continue to reduce the number um, of the subcontract or the 10? So, so one thing it's important to note, uh, I have to start off with, there will always be a need for a dedicated carrier service. You know, based upon uh, certain uh, demographics of our customer base, whether it be their physical disability or cognitive disabilities, there's always be a need for that type of door-to-door uh, -door specialized service that the dedicated carriers provide. But over time, I mean, looking back at when uh, the MTA first took over uh, the paratransit service from the city, it was really a 100% dedicated shared ride model. Today, it's a 60% non-dedicated, 40% dedicated model. We want to continue to offload some of those trips onto the non-dedicated side, and Mike and Alex are working hard to do that. And as we do that, we're looking, at, yes, to right-size the dedicated fleet. So how often do you renegotiate those contracts? And also so, making sure that they train their, their staff and, and also evaluate their on-time schedule and making sure that they're doing a good job. Yep. So uh, prior years, we would renegotiate those every 10 years, but we recognized that that was way too long. Yeah. So recently, we went to a, a five-year uh, contract term. Actually, as we speak right now, there's a request for proposal procurement for the next contract on the dedicated side. So are you going to still focus on five years, or are you going to do a lesser time than that? Yes. No, we're still looking to focus on the five-year period. We think that's the right period. And, and can I just add something, um, uh, council member? In terms of uh, having controls over our providers, I mean, one of the things that having numerous providers allows us to do is to see which ones are performing the best and shift trips when we need to. Some of the providers that we've terminated was for um, performance that we didn't believe was up to par. We do track all our trips. All the accessory vehicles have GPS locations on them, uh, GPS locators, which means we know exactly when and at what time vehicles arrive um, according to what's scheduled. Um, and and we, help, we, we hold carriers accountable. It is very possible we've gone down from 13 to 10. Um, in this new RFP that will probably be coming um, to a close when we pick new providers uh, in early 2020, that we'll have even less, that it may be five, six, or seven, and that, that determines how many vehicles that, that they will have and how many trips they'll perform. Um, if you think about you know, the testimony I gave at the board just on Monday, three years ago, 75% of all our trips were done by dedicated carrier. Today, 40% of our trips are done by dedicated carrier. 60% are done by some kind of taxi or FHV. 
We believe that there is another 10 to 15% that can be shifted, which we are doing gradually because we're working with customers with disabilities, customers who have different needs. So uh, um, we, we slowly but surely do it in, 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 in batches of, of, of hundreds. So somebody tries a broker trip, for some people, the taxi, the level of service presented by a taxi or four-hour vehicle, totally adequate, great. They love the service, flexible, wonderful. Some people, they take it, didn't work for me, my wheelchair didn't fit, the driver doesn't really know how to you know, properly guide me, door-to-door -door service, not just to the curb, um, all kinds of nuances. But if we get to a place where, let's say, it is 65 or 70 percent of all our service done by broker service by taxis, um, our dedicated fleet um, uh, will go down even further. We believe there is another 25 to potentially $30 million that can be saved by that reduction. And one of the main reasons for five-year contracts, um, aside from, uh, it has to do with the fact that um, there's so much facility and vehicles that go into a program like this, if we were turning it over every two or three years, we wouldn't even be getting the useful life out of a, a, of a vehicle or out of a facility that we put together uh, to run the program. So the longevity is kind of built, uh, helps us to account for costs. Yeah, and I would just like to add one thing that wasn't covered that was kind of into, in your question there. So the driver training isn't tied to the contract term, all right? So when drivers are hired, they undergo 80 hours of initial training, uh, which 32 hours are behind the wheel and 48 hours are a combination of classroom training and vehicle training and sensitivity training. And there's an annual refresher program for every driver of another 25 hours going back over that training program as long as they're, as long as they're operating under our service. Thank you. Um, the other question I have is that in September of this year, uh, the city council released a report on zoning for accessibility. So generally, how are the conversation surrounding zoning and accessibility coordinated uh, between MTA, DOT, because we wanna use that as a way to make more our subways, I mean, more accessible, because even though in your capital plan you talk about another 70, but the majority of the stations are not accessible. So can we work together, since there are so many rezoning and all, all this going on in the city, because um, in my district, I mean, I got a building that's taller, right on Broad Street, but they promised to make the Broad Street station accessible. Um, so I think that's, that's something that I want to see, like how's the discussion going, how we can work together on that. Uh, sure, uh, happy to address that question. I think discussions are going great. I mean, primarily working with DCP, the Department of City Planning on this. Um, we've been meeting regularly ever since the report came out. Uh, the Land Use Division for City Council has been really championing this. Uh, we're really, really excited about some of the things that are, uh, that are in this proposal. Um, it takes some of the very successful rezonings, like the Midtown rezoning or the Inwood rezoning, and it, the goal is to make that citywide. So whenever there are uh, rezonings or upzonings, um, we'll have opportunities to get accessibility improvements in our subway. And as, as, as part of a person in the discussions, I really think that the, uh, the land use division here is doing a fantastic job in getting ready for that. It will have to go through environmental reviews and other things for zoning, but uh, I believe there is, uh, over the coming years, once this is in place, while we work over the next 20 years, if not more, uh, to make our system accessible, numerous accessible stations that we are gonna get through this. And if you think about it, um, accessible stations, anywhere from 50 to $70 million, let's say this accounts for uh, 10 stations, I mean, which would be fantastic. That's uh, potentially 700 million to a billion dollars in costs that uh, we were able to get through zoning. So uh, I think the conversations are, are going very well and uh, stay tuned for updates when they, when they come out. Great. Thank you. Uh, I pass it back to the chair. Thanks. Councilmember Rodriguez. How many, what is your expectation on, if you think about in the next five, 10 years, when you look at the demand of people who need accessory right, what is your projection on that? So like I had mentioned in the testimony, I mean, currently we have 170,000 uh, registrants. 
Again, we recognize that New York City has one million, uh, over one million uh, elderly over the age of 65 and one million uh, disabled, um, disabled residents. So there is an opportunity really for the program to expand you know, at, a great, at a great rate. You know, currently what we've seen over the last two years, as I mentioned, is actually a 7% increase in our customer base and our registrants, yet a 30% increase in the number of trips that, uh, that we've provided. So it's not only uh, the potential for the registrants to go up based upon uh, the New York City demographics, but for the trip, uh, the trip counts to go up. So again, why I'm mentioning that is because we're really looking to see, number one, we're, we're here and we really want to engage the city, New York City, because the paratransit program is for the residents of New York City. And we're looking for a funding partner and to collaborate together on how we could further improve the paratransit program. We know we've done a lot of great things over the last two years, and the metrics are showing it and our customers are telling us that, but we really need to engage and to have that uh, collaboration as we look ahead. Yeah, and, and I think, sorry, just to add to Craig, council member, I, I think, you know, the, the, the potential of customers out there who would be eligible is, 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 is huge, is tremendous. I mean, these two, we, we had pretty flat growth before 2016, um, but when you look at 30%, pretty much going from 6 million trips in, in 2017, 2018, to 2019 now being at 8 million trips. I mean, uh, it, it's an incredible number. I mean, we're happy people are using the service, but we need to figure out what to do because on one hand, we are being challenged to make improvements to the service. On the other hand, we're also being asked to shoulder uh, the cost of the service. And just to give you an interesting stat, I, I mean, our approval rate for customers who apply to Accessoride are very high, well over 90%. So customers who apply go through a rigorous um, assessment at our assessment centers, and again, at a clip of greater than 90%, they are approved. Um, it's our job to follow ADA guidelines. If somebody needs a service, we, we, it is a requirement for us to give it to them, but um, there, there, there is uh, certainly a level of unpredictability um, as to you know, how many people uh, could potentially um, join the program? I, I, I just remember from the time when John Lou used to chair the commuter transportation, and, and we know that the discussion about assessor right, you know, to continue addressing a lot of red tape, a lot of loopholes there, and, and it's like from 2009 to today, and we've been in this whole situation about you know, sometimes mismanagement, sometimes lack of funding, sometimes, you know, how to make the program better. And and from, you know, the role that we play here in this community of transportation, you know, how important it is, you know, from the perspective of the health, from the perspective of, of the aging. But I just think that, first of all, the discussion shouldn't be about that the municipality in New York City, the one that, you know, that, that gave more other services because then, I'm not a lawyer, but if I would be a lawyer, I would say, okay, how many cities are under the MTA and which municipality contribute most to the MTA? And we know that as we as a city in New York is the one that use more, most of the trains to run our people, you know, from the different borough, we, and we are like a 24-hour system, but also we are the municipality that contribute the most from those who we have in Long Island, Westchester, Connecticut, or state. So I feel that we need to maintain the conversation about the need, the co first of all, the contribution of people that have physical challenges. That's the first thing, because we need to approach it not as we're doing a favor. This is about we need to pay back. This is about human rights. This is about he, we have one million individuals with physical challenges tomorrow, and I know that I'm not the one that I had to tell you about all the challenges that you go through because you live that experience. And, you know, and we get there because of age, we get there because you know, we, have, we can have it in a crash, you know, like, there's different reasons. But I, I think that you know, we need to fix it, we need to improve it. I just, $15 is, doesn't make sense at all. Because if you live, let's say, in the Bronx, and you need to move from the west to the east, and I had to take a green taxi, that's like $25. So we need to maintain, you know, first of all, the, the fear, you know, aligned with the course. 
when someone, the average New Yorkers, need a ride. And I know that you understand that. You know that you know, it will take decades for us to say that 24% no station accessible or accessibility that we are right now, we know that there's a plan and they will improve in the next five, 10 years. But still, we will not make it 100% affordable. I mean, accessible. You know, we are not there yet. And, and but the 15 doesn't make sense. I mean, don't, I think that that number, I just call for you to look at the numbers and see if at some point, and when you go back and talk to the chair, you know, uh, uh, to Pafoy and others, you know, let's look at that formula based around the price. You know, if you talk about someone, let's say, in Northern Manhattan, and someone is moving from Inwood through City College, you know, if you go from Dykeman to Columbia, New York Hospital, let's say it's a $15. By someone in Zeus that says, right, because they want to go, and it is their right to say, we like to go to, to take care of all the needs. And that costs 15, 25, 30 dollars. How can we deal with that? How can, what is your plan on, on, on those cases when the riders need the service for something that is more than the 15 dollars average in that, loca in that area? So, so I think what I like to say is, uh, I mean, we fully recognize the spontaneity that the on-demand pilot has provided for, for our, you know, 1,200 person pilot participants. But I think it's important to also recognize that it's not the core of our paratransit program, right? The core of our paratransit program, which is a zero denial program, uh, zero, you know, no trip, we don't ask for trip purpose, go anywhere you want within, you know, New York City, is our, you know, 24 hour advanced reservation system and provide that service today, 60%, as we said, via taxi and uh, green and yellow taxis, right? And I, you know, it's also important to note that today, two thirds of all trips on paratransit are non-shared ride, because we know that's what our customers prefer, a direct trip point to point. We're at two thirds of our trip provide that. So I think you know, we've done a lot of hard work over the last two years to improve the service. It's showing. And I think it's, the discussion is just not around you know, the paratransit of yesteryear. You know, with that recognition, we believe that there is a place, and, and an important place, for a spontaneous, spontaneous on-demand type of service. We know that other cities have availed themselves of that. We know that our customers are telling, telling us that they really appreciate the service. Now it's up to us in collaboration to figure out what is that next step. So as Alex said, this is a starting point not necessarily an ending point. But what we really recognize we need to do is we need to expand this current pool of participants. You know, 1,200 uh, customers is less than 1% of our customer base. Like we said, it's over 160,000 uh, registrants. We need to expand that. And then another important piece that we, we need to learn from is we recognize that when we first went into the uh, on-demand pilot, we just wanted to uh, test the waters, per se. We wanted to see how the taxi and limousine industry would uh, be able to support this on-demand pilot, right? In terms of uh, the wheelchair accessible vehicles, in terms of whether this would work for our customers in the outer boroughs as opposed to right here in, in Manhattan. So we went in there on a volunteer basis. And what happened was because it was a volunteer basis and we worked closely with our advisory, uh, paratransit advisory committee and other uh, advocacy groups, we recognized that it's some of the more sort of avid users. It's not representative of our full 170,000 customer base. You know, one, one uh, example of that is that on the full 170,000 customer base, about 80%, a little less than 80% are what we would consider uh, lower inactive users, meaning they take from zero to four trips in any given month. Um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 80%. On, in the 1,200 person pilot, it's closer to 40%, right? And, and the reason why I say that is because that's really where the most trip growth has occurred in this pilot, you know, tenfold, as, as Alex said in his testimony. You know, if we would extrapolate that over the full 170,000 registrant base, you know, it would just not be sustainable for us. So again, we're looking to expand. We, we, we put a starting point of the 16 trips and $15. We're gonna expand in a random way. In other words, the next 1,200 customers to be um, entered, we're gonna do in a random sample so that the 2,400 is a representative sample of the entire population, and we can really learn from trip patterns that evolve, and then in regards to next step, and again, it'll be a collaborative effort. Okay. My last question, and, and, 
And, and then before I ask a question, I, I need to apologize because when we were working to schedule this hearing, we already have a hearing, a meeting for the yellow, for the medallion task force that I also had to uh, participate as a co-chair together with Council Member Levin. So after asking the question, I will be excusing myself to go to the other meeting. But what I, I feel that, first of all, with the six providers that you have, how many, how many of those providers are women, black, or Latino? I'm sorry, the six providers? Are from you the referencing? providers, from those six so, that are already doing contract with the MTA. You mean the dedicated so, carrier? The, well, because we have, we have, just to clarify, we have 10 dedicated carrier providers. We have three broker providers, three e-hail providers. We have six assessment centers. We have a call center. So we have a number of subcontractors. I'm not sure uh, what you're referencing. I'm okay. sorry. From all those service providers in the Oh, what, what area, is the present? How well are we doing? What challenges that we, do we still have? in order to be sure that also there is an opportunity for women, black and Latino, to also provide those services. Yeah. So uh, we'll have to get back to you on that question. Okay. And, and my encouragement is about, you know, I love my friend who was sitting there. It could be from any app company, but this is not about we creating the opportunity for now to the app company yet to be the only one that take advantage for any program. I feel that we, as you know, we got here in 2019 at a point where Libre basically in closing, a yellow taxi medallion value went down. A, the green taxi, there's like 6,000 still, you know, tag permit that they have not been sold. So I feel again that, you know, I would like for to see how when you internally run this process, also have it in mind, we want the best quality. And for me, the services for the individual, the, the those who are today and, and whoever from not this group that is still are not there, we need in the future, we just need to be sure that whoever provided do the best services. But at the same time, I think it is important to be sure that in those who are the first one leading, you know, proposal, uh, putting plan together, that there's an effort also to have diversity because we have seen the city in Europe. Many times we talk about the WMB, and it's about, there's a good way of how institutions make those numbers that not necessarily, necessarily translate into the faces, in this case, of women and minority have been the one also having a fair share of providers. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get you the exact number, but I mean, as you are aware, I mean, the MTA has very aggressive uh, women and minority business enterprise goals on all the contracts. I mean, we, we, you know, the state legislature, Governor Cuomo has put forward, you know, the 30% goal. And our, you know, Chief uh, Diversity Officer Mike Garner, you know, was very active. As a matter of fact, I think the MTA is the, um, the number one agency in New York State as far as the percentage of money that goes to women and minority uh, disadvantaged business enterprises. But the exact percentage in the Paragenes program, we'll get back to you. Councilmember Holden. Thank you, Chair. Um, just want to uh, focus on some of the feedback you're getting in your surveys. Who, who performs those surveys? We have staff at uh, Paratransit headquarters that reach out and they call customers that have driven and, and used the broker service the day before and they speak to them about the service and run through a series of questions with them about the overall quality of the service. Could, could we get a copy of that, um, those, the questions that are asked and um, sure. from, from, from locations? I mean, because I'm here to tell you the truth. <laughs> I go to senior centers and they don't want to use the CESA ride they, to, to the person. I mean, I haven't really, you know, done a scientific uh, survey, but many people have given up using it. So I know that may be from years ago, the perception, and I think that the reality may be slightly different. I don't know, but I'm sure we're going to hear horror stories today, right. and, as we do, uh, you know, as council members. And so if I, if I may, councilman, and I, you know, I understand that you hear those stories, and even Alex said there, there will be those occasional stories, but I just want to reiterate that, you know, the numbers that we uh, shared today speak for themselves, meaning, you know, two million more trips were done on the program in the last two years, 
and those two million more trips were done because of tremendous hard work that has been put into the paratrooper. No, no, I'm not, I, I didn't say so that. I, I said want, no. I, I, I just. I'm not. I, I'm. Yeah. I'm just saying that it takes time to change people's perception. Sure. That's what. It, it might not be reality. We all know that. That um, if somebody had a bad experience five years ago, that's it. You know, I, I've done. I'm done. I was stranded, and so we. I understand that. I understand that's and and uh, that's why I. I just want to look at if I can change, go to senior centers and say, we have a new assessor ride, it's wonderful now, it's, you know, try it, let's try it. You know, if I can do that and feel confident, I will do that. Right. But I know that it takes time to, to change people. And um, that means I have a lot of seniors that are shut-ins now because they feel they have no options. So I need to go out and tell my constituents do it. Let's and here's what we've done, and here's uh, um, how it's improved. And I appreciate all your efforts, and I'm sure there is an improvement. Mm -hmm. However, um, the, the the we talked about like GPS. Are they're on all the vehicles now. Yes. And, go ahead. Somebody wants to say well, something. Well, so in the interest of transparency, we we are publishing a public dashboard now that has all our operating statistics on it. And those operating statistics are being fed by GPS on the vehicles. So it's, there's no manual intervention there. It's all coming from data and feeding into the on-time performance. And I'm going to add that we've been putting up on-time performance figures that are the best that that system has ever had, and consistently. Yeah, it looks I mean, I, I know the challenges in New York City to be on time for anything uh, is getting more difficult. We all see that on our roads. Um, and the customers with uh, disabilities or the customers in wheelchairs, um, they all have an app to, to track? No, and that's the, that's the thing. Well, so the MTA, the My AAR app, is available to every customer. They, they can, they can uh, avail themselves of the app, yes. They can? They can, yes. And how many have? Do we have a, you so know? So I'll just take this and I'll highlight it. Um, just recently, we had our highest uh, day of um, uh, tricks, trips booked via the app, which was 3,000 trips on any given day, which is about 10%. So uh, we, we hope to see continued uptick of trips being booked via the app and trips being tracked via the app. Because the booking obviously reduces our call center volume. The tracking allows customers to know right away. But even if um, uh, customers aren't using the app, they are getting calls, they're getting notifications, they're getting text messages from our brokers to let them know when their vehicles are close, when they're not close. And, and, and it, this really speaks to our work to make Accessoride more user friendly. So even if a vehicle's running late, how do we let you know? Even if a, a vehicle's downstairs and you don't know about it, how do we let you know? So um, uh, the other part is just that while we're modernizing our scheduling system and while we continue to develop uh, our new dispatching system, we are uh, tweaking and, and, and changing how we uh, do our o automatic vehicle location and GPS tracking. So um, we're right now in the process of development. We've had a couple um, you know, issues over the last few months on certain days. But overall, that's because we're developing a brand new system that is going to be much more accurate, much better, and give customers pretty much real-time uh, information as to where their vehicles and trips are. And as, as, as more people use the app, do you get a higher um, percentage of people actually satisfied with the service? Do you, are you seeing that? Are you, are you comparing the data? Like, let's say the, people get the, get the app, they use it, and they feel better about the service because they know where it is, they know they're tracking it, and then your customer surveys improve. Is that? We, we, we uh, don't have enough data yet because the app came out just um, a little bit, le little bit less than a year ago. So um, in terms of comparing better, uh, we, we've just started to add those questions into our surveys because there's so many factors that can be determinative of what makes a customer happier about their trip. It could be a taxi picked them up and got them there uh, directly um, and they used the app or they didn't. So we have to extrapolate that within uh, more granularly within the surveys that the app and the tracking and the notifications made their experience better. So that will hopefully be in our surveys uh, to come in early 2020. So, so what I would ask, if you, have, if you could send me something where I could use as talking points, because I'm always talking to seniors, I'm visiting senior centers, I want to promote it, uh, I want to 
say how great it is now, and and um, and, and then we, you know, and then we'll certainly spread the word and we'll change the perception. But I appreciate your your testimony. Thank you very much. Yeah, you. you know, I'd like to just add one thing. You know, we do extensive outreach, and if you would like us to go to any of your senior centers with you, for you, and you know, in response to questions, we'd be happy to do that. That's even better. Thank you very much. You're Thanks welcome. so much. Thank, thanks, Chair. I mean, I, I think, you know, I want to acknowledge that we've come a long way um, in terms of the delivery of service for Accessoride. Um, you know, we've even, uh, the, the new pilot, well, it wasn't a pilot, the new rule that allows the use of bus lanes as a means of getting um, these vehicles in and out of traffic as quickly as possible uh, to, towards their destination. But I think that, you know, we had a press conference just a few minutes before this hearing, and, you know, life-changing is a word that came up time and time again. Um, the, the freedom to pick up the phone and say, you know, I have a spontaneous need right now. I had a death in the family. Um, you know, I have to, you know, I have to show up in school because maybe my child, you know, had an emergency. These are, these are life, you know, issues. These are things that are unpredictable. And so I think that as, 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 you know, as, as great as any improvement to the existing, um, accessory ride, uh, systems are, I think that they don't. They, they will never really meet the expectation of an individual who's just looking for the freedom to be able to, you know, do what the rest of us do so freely and get up and go on demand um, when we need to. And if, if you're saying to me that in your testimony that you're basing the numbers of, of rides to 16, it doesn't seem like there's an abuse of, of, of the system, but rather people just using it um, for day to day, and I think that that's something that sometimes, you know, and I, I get that, you know, that this, the, the fact that we have to fund these programs is a reality um, because nothing comes for free, and so that's something that we have to figure out, but having to plan your day a day in advance doesn't always work out the way that we intend, um, and that is, that's a, that's a real issue for many of the individuals in this room today. Um, not having the luxury of driving to and from destinations like I do just about every single day. I couldn't function without my vehicle as we are moving you know, in the city to uh, a city that's um, less dependent on, on, on vehicles uh, being on the street. There have to be alternative options for those of us that don't have the ability to just you know, go down the stairs to the, to the local train, um, grab a bus easily on the corner, you know, as close as possible to our place of residence. Um, it would also help, I believe, get more people uh, employed. If people are able to get to work, you know, I think that that's always a benefit. We can, so. So I, you know, I, 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 I appreciate, you know, the, the efforts, but I think that until accessory right is not as spontaneous, it's never really going to meet, you know, the expectations of those individuals that utilize those, that, that service. And so, you know, I, I will definitely be looking at this um, for the next, you know, few weeks, just trying to better understand where, uh, as a council, where we can kind of, you know, put our two cents and see how we can be helpful because it's a project that I would like to see um, continue, but I, I also am cognizant of the fact that we need to make sure that it is financially uh, sustainable. And so I appreciate your, your being here today, and I think Councilmember Lander had a question. Thank you, uh, Chair Ayala, and I just really want to associate myself with those remarks. You know, I, this is just heartbreaking because for many years, you know, I've been in office for 10 years, and for so many years, um, Accessoride users approached us with, this is just such a broken system. It, it doesn't work, we can't schedule it, you know, with me, you know we, it, we can't count on it when it's supposed to come, and then meanwhile, it costs so much money, just like making it impossible for people to participate as full and equal New Yorkers, and then you try a pilot, and it works stunningly. You know, it's like one of the best things that's been done in government in my time in office. I remember when we had the first hearing about you talking about it, because 10 years ago, there wasn't Uber and Lyft, there weren't on-demand services, we were still kind of thinking through the yellow taxis, and then this happens, and you guys agree to do a pilot, and it works almost as well as anything in government I've ever seen. 
a set of people who were locked out of equal participation in our city now have equal participation in our city, like magic, and its per trip cost is dramatically cheaper than the old system that was totally unequal. And like, that was so hopeful and everyone was so happy and I was like, great, this will be an opportunity for disabled New Yorkers to participate. And then you just like pull the rug right out from under it. And I understand that you're cost constrained, but we gotta find a way to do better than that. So um, I guess I wanna ask a couple of questions. So for folks in, in the traditional Accessoride program, just for today, remind me, what, what's the average cost per trip and what's the average number of okay. trips per monthly customer? So, so the average cost per trip uh, for the, um, the dedicated, as we said earlier, was about $85. On the broker side, which we're doing 60% uh, of the trips, it's about $35 to $37. The average number of trips that customers are taking, now again, I'll go back, we have 170,000 registrants. On any given month, about 60 to 70,000 take a trip. So if you look at that average, it's about 10 trips per month. Okay, so the average person in the traditional non-broker program, 80 bucks a trip, about 10 trips a month. Uh, so, so 10 trips is over the entire uh, customer base, either taking broker or- I, I know, but I need some averages here, because yeah, so, so 10, those yeah, customers 10. on average are costing us $800 a month, if, if the average is steady across that you just gave me. But I, I, I don't, the average would have to be split by, we're doing 60% of our trips on broker. So 60% of all our trips are coming in at that 34, uh, $35 rate, and 40% of our trips are coming in at that uh, $80, $80, $80 rate that we quoted you. As we mentioned a little bit okay, earlier. Well, what's the average across the two, if you wanna give me that? Because either way, I mean, 80 times 10 is 800, 55. and 15 times 16 is 241. Okay. So, and 34 times 10 is 340. $51. $51 is average. 51 on average. So the average customer right now, we're spending $510 a month on. Okay, so why is this new program you're proposing limiting people to $241? Well, no, a couple things. First of all, it's not limiting anybody. Everybody still has the ability to use our traditional um, um, service. But... Uh, what we've seen, if we, if we take our, the 1,200 customer base, right, take, take the other 150,000 out of it for a second. Um, as an average, and, and I, I, I will say that we've, we, there's a lot of different trip patterns, right? Even within the pilot, there is customers that aren't taking any trips. There's customers that are taking two, and there are customers that are taking more than 100 on demand trips a month. So I'll speak as kind of like the average range. Even when you talk about our low customers, customers between zero and four trips a month, they are now taking um, uh, at, at many outcomes 10, 10 times that. They're now 20 trip a month customers, 15 trip a month customers. In the medium range, customers who take five to 15 trips a month. So the volume that we've seen as an increase per these customers um, has created a real challenge for us to implement this program in a cost-effective manner. So all those cost savings you talk it about- hasn't, Just to be clear, it hasn't created a challenge to implement the program in a cost-effective manner. It costs a lot of money. It's actually pretty go. easy to implement, right? Sure enough. Much easier to implement than the current Accessori program. It's just much more expensive. Yes. Okay. But even just sticking with the average, like if you offered people 500 the $500 worth of trips a month, that would be double what you're offering here. So you could do 30 trips a month at six at 15 bucks a trip, but I think and they would be the average customer in the system. And I don't know, maybe people, I'd like to hear testimony, you know, maybe people would say, I'll take that. I won't use may any may more of the on-demand Accessoride service mm -hmm. if I had 30 trips a month that I knew I could use from Access, you know, on the on-demand. So if I may just take a step back for a second, uh, recognizing the calculations you're trying to go through, I think it's important to um, also, again, going back to 2017 when we were looking to improve the paratransit program, the paratransit, the on-demand pilot was a very, very small portion of what we did to improve the program, right? We invested a lot of money in the program. We went from a $475 million program to currently in 2019 a $614 million program, right? So if that's... 150 million almost, right? Somewhere in that neighborhood, maybe a little bit less. And 
uh, the, our 160,000 registrants are really enjoying the benefits of that program. And how do I know that? Because two million trips have been done over those last two years, right? Those 150, 160,000 registrants are taking two million more trips. They're enjoying the current paratransit program. A small piece of our improvement program was, uh, was the 1,200 person pilot. And I recognize that people really appreciate the spontaneity of that. I fully recognize that, but that's not, it's, that's it's not, not the core the of the program. I mean, I just that's want to object the there. Spontaneity makes it sound like kind of like a whim that you might have on like a once on a while on a Thursday afternoon. I mean, it is the difference between people being able to, to lead more full and equal lives in our city so, like I'm able to do. And I, I, I mean, so if I, may I really want to understand what the cost of it is, because if you would come in here and say, Here's the cost of the program we would like to implement. You're right. What would, be, what would feel more honest to me, and I'll just leave it here because I don't want to go back and forth and take any more time. Like, if you came in here and said, look, we accept that what we've been hearing from people is true. This is a dramatically different, uh, the, the, the pilot works so well. People are able to participate in the life of our city in full and equal ways, but it's very expensive. So here's a few choices. Um, if we were to really do it in an unlimited way, it might cost us, I don't know, two, three billion dollars. Tell us what the cost would be. Or here's a set of choices for how we could limit it. You know, we could say to people, you can either have 30 rides a month in the on-demand program, in the on-demand program, and that would cost X, or you could have unlimited access, and that would cost Y. Um, like, you're right, there's a hard choice to make, but mostly it's just money. You know, it's like we know this thing works well, and we have to figure out what we're willing to spend for it. So, so I know Alex wants to say something. Guys, we, you can, yes, you can wave your hands, but we can't clap. There's a hearing next door, so we're interrupting them. Thank you. And, and I'll just, I wasn't, I mean, yeah, I'm trying to do the math on the fly, and I guess I'll ask, how did you get to the 16 on-demand trips with the $15 a month? Like, where does that number come from? So I think Alex has spoken to that, and I'll let him continue, but um, 16 was the median, the median number of trips that the on-demand pilots were taking. Um, participants, I'm sorry, the on-demand participants were taking. That's the median they were taking when they had no limit at all? Yes. Yes. So if we limited them to 16, then actually the median would go down to, we don't know what. That's what we're hoping to study and, and see. And I, I want to address a couple of things that you said, if you don't mind, Councilman Leonard. Um, and I know you care passionately about this issue, so I, I don't mean to, no, no, you know, no, but I want us to get to the right place together. Of course. And, 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 you know, one thing that we said before we came in, I mean, we do believe this is a start, right? This is a start of the parameters. There's a lot of room to grow. But what I would say is, even if you think about, you mentioned $500 a month, um, we have seen a very significant modal shift. Pick any customer who used to be traditional, right, service all the time. Now they're in the pilot. Um, very significant modal shift, maybe 70, 80 percent. But some trips, even customers in the on-demand pilot, are still using traditional service. You may ask yourself, why would they ever do that, right? If you've got an app and on-demand, why would you still call the day before? We know that a lot of trips are still not being completed in the on-demand pilot. If you're in Staten Island, if you're in certain parts of Queens, you can go on that app for hours. And there's just no taxi coverage there yet. We're, we're working very hard to get the TLC to expand yes. Uber and Lyft and for hire vehicle, accessible vehicle coverage to the whole city. Oh. That's an obligation that we have. Yes, we're 100% on the same and page. And if you want to, people yeah. want to schedule, great. Like, I'm not, I'm not against people yeah. scheduling their trips in advance. No, that sometimes I like to I'm, schedule mine I'm, in advance. I'm just too. saying that the $500 uh, to on demand is never the whole picture, right? There's still some trips that are being done on traditional service that also needs to come into that factor. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of different, um, a lot of different uh, factors that go into this. And we want to see it expand. Look, the 16 trips that we mentioned uh, is a median, right? There was half the customers taking more, half the customers taking less. The, me the, the, the numbers were unbelievable. There were some customers still in the on-demand pilot having this at their, at their disposal, still taking zero to two trips. There were other customers taking over 100 trips. So for us to be able to, in an ADA-compliant way, uh, manage to offer services to such a wide scale and to do so in a fiscally responsible way is very difficult. Um, as I explained, the $15 subsidy is something that we looked at other cities where they started and have grown. So that's kind of how we got here. If in phase two, the, the, the two things may happen. The trip patterns we observe um, are 
you know, let's say more modest than we've seen for the high users in the current pilot, we might be able to, to, to expand. That would be the number one thing that would help us raise the parameters. The number two thing would be another source of funding. Whether it's the city or something else comes together with some money, we would absolutely love to throw it at this. So I'm just gonna conclude by asking that for the future. If you could give us um, some cost parameters, I get the money doesn't grow on trees and that you've priced a program here. But if you could follow up with us and maybe give a couple options of what expansion of this program under some different conditions would look like, whether that's different from the $15 or different from the 16 trips or different from the 2,400 people, and help us know what they cost, then I think both in our budget process and our conversations with the state, we can, you know, recognizing that doing this costs money, but hearing how much it matters, we can try to figure out what ways we might move forward. So thank Absolutely. you for, uh, for the indulgence, Chair. You're lucky I like you, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> We've been joined by Councilmember Cohen, who I like just as equally, but hopefully you won't be as long-winded. I'll be very brief. In fact, you know, I, I've worked closely with the, with the members of this panel on a variety of issues, uh, accessibility issues in my own district, and I do feel good about that. So I, I really am good, and I, I don't want to beat anybody up. Uh, and, I, and I also think that you know a lot of the things I, I judge by are, our constituents complaining to my office about X. And, and I will say, I feel like complaints about Accessoride, which were in my first term were a lot, and you know, were some of the really the toughest cases. People who were, you know, couldn't, you know, who missed a doctor's appointment or couldn't get home from a doctor's appointment or you know, were really, you know, who were, or who were on a vehicle for a ridiculous amount of time. They were really horrific stories, and I will say, that those complaints that I've gotten have gone down, I guess, significantly. Uh, but the services are just, I just really just want to make the point that the services are so vital, are so desperately needed that they really, you know, it's the difference between being able to uh, participate and not participate to be between, you know, just taking advantage of everything that the city has to offer. So I, I'm not going to belabor the point, and I know that, and, and again, we have a good track record of working together. I'd like to continue and build upon that. But I just want to go on record on behalf of the people I represent how important these services are. So thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming today. It was a pleasure having you, and uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation in the weeks to come. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Somebody can stay behind and hear from some of the panelists. Yes. Yes, we will. Thank you. So the first panel is Yating Lim, Joanna Clemenko, Dustin Jones, Valerie Joseph, and Brittany Wilson. Okay. Justin, you want to start? 
Dustin. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me, um, for giving me the option to speak today um, on this very important situation. Um, I've been a part of this e-hill almost since the beginning, um, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. It has been a very big help. It has been life-changing, as we've said. Um, I can't think of many ways how I'd be able to travel without it. You know, whether it comes with bad weather, um, the distance. I have family who lives in Far Rockaway, my mother who is sick. You know, I, I work. I, I can't imagine having to travel and hearing bad news and I have to have at least $50 to go and come back, you know, just to make sure that I can come back. Um, back home safely or wherever I'm going. I want to also call out things the way it's supposed to be called out, and I want to say shame on MTA again, shame on all of its leadership in every aspect down the board. This is absolutely criminal to sit here and, first of all, come here, and you don't even have the, the at least the, the leadership to say, you know, we understand that there's problems, there's understand, we understand what's going on. None of these people know what it's like to have to travel and plan out your day. None of these people take the train. None of these people take the bus. None of these people are on accessor ride. But they're all making choices about what we need to do. All of them have the luxury to drive and move around the way they want to. We don't have that option. I am not a rich person. I cannot afford $15 a trip. I don't understand how is it that I can ride Accessoride every single day, four times a day at 275 per trip, but I can't sit here and ride e -hail for you know under how many times? It doesn't make any sense. Also, in conclusion, I would I also like to say is the MTA is quick to claim that they don't have any money, but just recently, I saw that they have $1.4 million to buy 15 buses f exclusively for the M14 line that are um, air compliant or whatever, I don't know, but retract your spending, stop coming up in here and lying, and give us what we need, what we want. This is a civil right. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for ha having me have the opportunity to speak here today. My name is Valerie Joseph. I'm the Accessorite Advocate for the Brooklyn Center for the Independence of the Disabled. We are a core member of the Accessorite Reform Group, also known as ARG. We are pleased to be here with so many advocates with the same m message. The Accessorite Pilot Program has been life-changing for 1,200 people in the program. And the MTA plans to drastically limit its usefulness, and that will be a huge mistake. I plan to touch on why this program is so important to me and why it needs to be expanded in a smart way, not the way the MTA is doing it. Over the last two years, I've used On Demand to go to and from work, to get to meetings during work, and to visit friends and family without the hassle of regular Accessoride van service. For the first time in my life, I'm able to ride in the same way everyone else is in New York City, when I want and where I want. I don't have to call for a ride a day in advance. I don't have to wait two hours between rides. I can go straight to where I want to go without mi making stops that take me far out of my way. I also recruited dozens of people to join this program, so, th so as the MTA encourages us to do, en encouraged us to do, excuse me, and many of them use it regularly to go to and from work, to get to appointments, and just to have fun. But now the MTA wants to cut back the program without testing it to see how the general accessoride ridership will respond to on demand. Only that way can tell us how the on demand will cost and if it offers all accessoride users the chance to use it, not limit. Thank you, Valerie. Good afternoon. Oh. You press the red button. Yes, thank you. There we go. Good afternoon. My name is Brittany Wilson. I'm a civil rights attorney, a native of Brownsville, Brooklyn, 
and I've been an Accessoride user for approximately 18 years since I was 11 years old. Um, so I can tell you about the bad old days and today. Um, I use it five days a week, twice a day to travel to and from work, Brooklyn and Manhattan. And I've seen and experienced many things that illustrate the need for change. For example, one day after work in June of 2017, after we'd arrived at my house, my Accessoride driver informed me that he had to pee and then proceeded to urinate into a coffee cup in front of me on the bus before assisting me off the vehicle. This experience made me painfully aware of my vulnerability based on my disability and gender, among many other factors, to the whims of drivers who hold my life and well-being in their hands. I also realized that as someone who's been responsible for monitoring other public officials' training in compliance with the United States Constitution and federal civil rights laws, I have absolutely no idea whether and what training the drivers I encounter on a daily basis receive with respect to these same issues, as well as on issues of ableism and other types of bias that might affect their work performance. And because I heard the, the MTA representative here today, I'm not talking about sensitivity training. No one knows what that is. Um, also, with respect to e hail and broker vehicles, I've never used on demand, although Obviously, it would be a huge help as someone who has meetings and has to work late um, to have that level of flexibility. I have used broker vehicles that, for example, drivers won't help you get into the vehicle. Um, I actually got out of a broker vehicle a few months back because there was another passenger in there. We've been riding around for a while. He wasn't able to tell me where we were going and when. There was a significant language barrier between me and the driver. And to illustrate the extent of the language barrier, um, someone called him over the radio to relay a complaint that someone else had filed about him. And in order for him to understand that complaint, he called someone to translate what the person over the radio was saying to him. So he definitely couldn't communicate with me about my needs as a customer. So I have questions about the mechanisms for training and um, observing the drivers who function as e-hail and broker vehicles as well. Um, I had a plan, I'm gonna deviate from the plan just because some of the stuff I heard today um, about the improved GPS systems that are supposedly coming into the vehicles. I've been on some of those vehicles with the new GPSs. I can tell you that the problem is not the GPS, the problem is Accessoride routing. Um, if you're gonna take me from East Brooklyn through Queens to Midtown before dropping me off in Lower Manhattan, that's not a GPS problem. The GPS can tell you how to get there faster or most efficiently, but that's not the source of the problem to begin with. And we need to address the root of the problem. Similarly, um, we talked about caps on on demand and cabs and things of that nature. Um, I've been on both sides of the equation because like I said, I've been using it since I was 11. And so I've been that student who can't afford to pay $40 to get back home to Brooklyn, and I'm now the attorney who literally budgets $200 a month to be able to take taxis when Accessoride doesn't do what it needs to do. Um, and I should note that that, that that rule about if they're 30 minutes or late, later, they'll give you your money back. I'm still waiting for money back that I spent a year ago. So that's important. Um, wanted to raise those points, I'll let other people speak. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. Greetings, um, council members and, and MTA members and fellow advocates. My name is Johanna Clemenko, and I wear multiple professional hats. I'm a mind-body psychotherapist, a dance movement therapist, a nonverbal communication analyst. I direct a treatment training and cons consulting center using these modalities. We work with individuals, families, groups, and systems. I'm a social worker with a specialty working with people with disabilities. I'm also an e hail on-demand passenger. It is this program, the on-demand program, that enables me to navigate my professional life and do all the rehab maintenance that allows me to maximize my function and minimize my pain. Beating the red-haired stepchild characterizes how the MTA relates to the vulnerable communities of disabled accessoride passengers 
and the endangered species of New York City cab drivers. When the program was conceived in 2017 by former Accessoride director Steve Lopiano, it was intended to replace 99% of Accessoride rides with um, of traditional Accessoride rides with on-demand on -demand taxi service. It would then also have the concomitant result of saving the beleaguered New York City taxi industry. To blame the shortfall of the MTA budget on the tiny group of 1,200 passengers in the EHIL on-demand pilot program and allied cab drivers is cynical and deceitful. The MTA is notoriously opaque in its operations. The current budget is billions of dollars in the red. The infrastructure replacement and construction of new subway lines, for example, has cost 10 times more than Compro pro programs in Paris and London. To link this cost overrun to our tiny pilot program is indecent. The program has enabled accessoride passengers to finally have quality of life to work, to, to go to medical and physical therapy maintenance, experience New York City's cultural life, and, and visit with loved ones. Translation, current e-hail on-demand passengers are, quote, heavy users because it is primarily a working population. Therefore, this group is paying city taxes and state taxes. If accessoride passengers are relegated to van service, there is much less likelihood of being able to adhere to a work schedule. Normal accessoride passengers often take, uh, transport often takes up to three hours from target pickup time to drop off. Passengers are required to wait outside for their transportation, regardless of weather conditions. Please imagine that in climate change extremes and travel through other boroughs to get through their destinations. Therefore, there is more likelihood of normal accessoride passengers relying on fixed income disability support rather than enduring the vagaries of ordinary accessoride. Maximizing quality of life is what everyone aspires to, and transit for able-bodied people is available via an MTA unlimited card. So why will the MTA now make the lives of accessoride passengers again limited? This is a critical question. The notion that to assess the pilot program objectively by quantifiable variables, it's necessary to be to totally alter, to totally alter it makes no evaluative sense. If the intention is to objective, objectively evaluate the pilot program, let us do that by alterating altering one variable at a time. Let us keep the pilot as it is, and then, in a research model, systematically alter one variable at a time sequentially. The program is working beautifully for disabled passengers and beleaguered taxi drivers whose fate is intertwined. In sum, this program is the smartest innovation of the MTA in our era. Let us expand upon it as it was intended to be, and study the results empirically. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Ayala and Chen and, and members of the committee. My name is Ya Ting Lu. I'm Director of Government Affairs and Policy at VIA. We are a New York City headquartered and founded technology company that's powering public mobility solutions around the world. We're partnering with municipalities and transportation agencies where our technology, our routing system, our algorithms is helping to make sort of public uh, transportation um, more accessible uh, and more um, re reliable across the board. That's being used in a variety of use cases from paratransit to school buses to first and last mile, microtransit and so on. You have my full testimony there. I won't read from it. I'll try to summarize sort of our, our points and some recommendations that we like to share with uh, members of this committee. There's an opportunity here, given that it's 2019, and so much has tra transformed in the technology space around transportation for the MTA to ask itself, if we were to start from scratch with the paratransit service, 
is this the way that we would design it? Is this the way that we would go about procuring services? And, and we think the answer is, is no. Um, I think one of the key structural challenges for the MTA leadership and staff is overcoming sort of the legacy and siloed Byzantine procurement processes that's been in place um, that's now created sort of these three siloed systems, dedicated courier service, a broker service, and now this more innovative solution that they're sort of experimenting with, with the e-hail pilot. But we think that these three system, systems and the way that they're procuring for it uh, Council Member Chen, you touched on the multiple different vendors um, under each of these categories, really does create sort of additional administrative layers and costs that we think could be streamlined. Technology companies like VIA, we've developed really powerful and sophisticated software platforms that can really single stream uh, and receive trip requests, match the passenger with the appropriate vehicle, create the most efficient route, add additional passengers where appropriate without deviating too much from the trip, provide real-time locating tracking of vehicles, create greater visibility and accountability and from a customer experience, um, of customer feedback experience, kind of real-time tracking on all of that. Um, one quick example. VIA uh, recently, starting in 2020, will transform the paratransit system in Hampton Roads, uh, Virginia. It's a region serving uh, more than 1.6 million people. There was a legacy paratransit system. They issued three separate RFPs for the call center service, a wheelchair van service, and an ambulatory sedan service. Rides had to be booked at least a day in advance over the phone, fares paid in cash. VIA won all three RFPs with our proposal for a single integrated solution comprising all three existing services. Now the VIA paratransit service will allow riders to book same day or in advance over the phone by using an accessible app. Riders can pay with credit cards or other non-cash payment methods. Um, the rides could be booked with smartphones or over the phone, and all of these vehicles could be tracked in real time. So essentially, we're kind of bringing all of the sort of customer experience and convenience in the ride shared space into the paratransit space. We think that could be done. Lastly, I, I do want to just say that, you know, we, we do applaud the MTA's efforts to trying to seek new ideas. They last week just held a whole conference inviting technology companies to come share ideas on how they can modernize the subway signal system at lower costs. We think that the MTA should do that as well for paratransit, and companies like VIA would really welcome the opportunity to really rethink the whole system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Amprey Samuel. Thank you for your testimony, everyone. Um, and to um, Brittany and the other customers, have you officially ever logged a complaint? And what was that process like for you? And uh, was there like official responses? I know you mentioned the um, reimbursement. Um, but uh, you also shared with me a story about um, one of the drivers even asking to go into your home and heat up food. Yep. Um, is that something that you, um, you know, relay back to? Absolutely. MTV? So can you just talk <laughs> about that process? Yes, um, I'm very familiar with the accessory ride complaint process. For the driver who urinated, I, I immediately picked up the phone and called and pressed the number eight to file a complaint. Um, and that driver was ultimately fired. Um, I spoke to uh, accessory ride representatives. We had interviews um, and he was fired. Um, with respect to my other complaints, I did file a complaint about the driver who asked to come into my house to heat up a cup of porridge. Um, usually when you file a complaint, um, you go online, where I do, I go online um, to the MTA website. There's an accessorized specific button and you sort of type out what happened to you and they send you like a form response like, thank you for submitting your complaint or something of that nature. Um, and then I believe I don't remember if they got back to me on that specific one, but it doesn't matter because it's usually some sort of form response of like, we're so sorry that happened to you. We're working to improve the system, something of that nature. Um, and so I, ha I have tons of, if you search my right ID number, you'll see that I have filed tons of complaints in that way. Um, and, and with me in particular, I should say, probably as a result of my other advocacy and, and my stories about the urination and the fact that they know that I'm a civil rights attorney, they, they, they're tracking me now. Um, and I should say, that's not what I want. Um, I don't, actually when I came in here today, an MTA representative whom I've never met 
said, oh, Brittany, it's good to see you. We've spoken by phone. I, psh, I don't know how she knows me. I don't know her. So they're tracking me. And I think that's sort of their political way of, of, of addressing these problems. We're going to get to the renegades, the problem people. And that's not a systemic policy change. Thank you. Councilmember Vanol. Well, first, I want to thank our super chairs for conducting this very important hearing. Sorry I was late, but there are many hearings going today. For those on the, on the panel and those who came today, please have your voices. You are not renegade complainants. You are the number one complaint that pretty much every council member gets. And so we will continue to have these hearings. And when you have council members like council members Ayala and Chen, you are in good hands uh, to do that. So I thank you for having this hearing. Uh, keep your advocacy going. I'll tell you there are, I love hearing Dia's ideas. I think those are the type of technological advances and ideas that we need to embrace going forward, streamlining the system, making it more accessible and easier for people to navigate, especially for our seniors and those with disabilities, which are the hardest to navigate and the most important to provide those services. So I thank you for that. Um, and I know a lot of the council members are coming up with innovative ideas on their own with their own districts to try to circumvent that, um, but that's not the answer. That's just another Band-Aid to try to help our number one. So I just wanted to thank uh, today's panel, those who came today, and the chairs for continuing the fight uh, to change this system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. The next panel is Kathleen Collins, Jean Ryan, Michael Ring, Lucia Merritt, Vincent Padula, and Jose Hernandez. Is Kathleen? Okay, okay. Yeah, second. Okay, no, I just wanted to make sure that you went first because I know you had a time. Okay, I'm ready to start. Thank you. Go ahead. Great. Yes, My name is Kathleen Collins. I'm an attorney. I worked for the Port Authority for 30 years and retired in 2012. I have an accounting background. I passed the CPA exam, though I'm not a certified public accountant because I haven't done the uh, public accountancy part, the internship. But so I know about finance. I know about money, I know about the law, and I know about government agencies. I know all about everything. And the first thing that strikes me here today is that everybody that's talking, and everybody that's talking even up there on the podium, doesn't use Accessoride and may not even be using the regular transportation system of the subways and that. The people that use the system aren't represented here, except here now that we're talking. I don't understand that. The people that are making decisions need to use the system, need to use the subways, need to use the buses, need to use excess ride. We don't need any more people being appointed just because they look like us. We need people that actually do what we do, experience what we experience every day. Second, we talk about why, what do you use this for? I don't ask anybody up there, why do you go in your car every day? Why do you go on the subway? Why do you go on the bus? I don't ask you that. That is a total affront to me, that you should ask them, why am I using that system? That is disgraceful. It shows you don't even understand the legislation. 
that this is a civil rights legislation. You would never even think of asking that of any other minority, but you ask that of us. That is disgusting. I vote, and I have voted since I was 18 years old. I was born this way. And when I first voted, I had to use an absentee ballot because I couldn't even get into the voting location where I had to vote. I have friends that have heard that they actually climbed up the stairs to get to their voting place. I wouldn't put myself through that in dignity. But I just don't understand this whole system. You talk about money. Do you ask others, do you ask subway riders how much it costs for each subway ride for the MTA for them? No. Do you ask bus riders and the MTA, how much does it cost for each bus ride that you take or you take? No. But you ask, how much does it cost for us to take accessoride? That's outrageous. Next, I've been using accessoride, and now they use this brokerage system. And you say it's all the MTA's fault, MTA, MTA. Well, you're at fault too, because I'm using them, and you license the brokers, and you license the, ta the taxis. And when I go in them, they don't have seat belts or shoulder belts. What are you doing about that? That's your obligation to be deciding and finding out the answers to. Not just theirs, yours. I want you to find out why are there no seat belts and shoulder belts. And if they show you a seat belt or shoulder belt, ask them how they fasten it. Because I've only had one or two rides where I've had an actual shoulder belt. Actually, I, had, I think it was only one ride where I had a shoulder belt. I was ready to kiss the driver that he had a shoulder belt and a seat belt for me. I'd other, I think I maybe had two other rides where I had a seat belt. And all the other rides, I don't get a shoulder belt. I don't get a seat belt. They look at me like I have three heads. And they sometimes bring out a belt, but they have no place to fasten it. That's your obligation to find out why the Taxi and Limousine Commission is derelict in their duty and making them have seat belts and shoulder belts. That's your obligation. Thanks. And I'll tell you one last thing. I didn't use Accessoride when I was working because I could never have been an attorney and travel as an attorney because I had no spontaneous ability to move about. I used car service, and it cost me a lot, a lot of money. And as a Port, a, a port Authority employee, I didn't make booger bucks like they, you know, if you're a private attorney. And, you know, private attorneys here, yeah, they make lots of them make big bucks. But Wall Street wasn't coming, knocking on my door to hire me, because I don't look like their normal, you know, Wall Street attorneys. So I just want you to know that, too, that really, come on, get the money up. Thank Get you. things going. I work for I work for and I paid taxes I all my life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And I now I gotta run because right. Cinderella's calling accessorize. Thank you. All right. No, it's fine. How you doing? My name is Jose Hernandez. I am the New York City Advocacy Coordinator for United Spinal Association. And I'm one of the commissioners of the Civic Engagement Commission appointed by the mayor um, in 2019. Um, I wanted to talk a little about the accessory program. And it does definitely needs an overhaul because it, as it stands right now, um, it's very inefficient, no real time. And they spend $680 million on the program, it looks like, uh, in 2019. And there's no reason why it, even the traditional blue and white um, broker service, the regular access right program, doesn't have a real-time component and a tracking system, and it's $680 million. If companies like Uber, Lyft, and Via can do it, there's no reason why the MTA can't do it. Um, as far as the eHail program, uh, right now, they are using the yellow and the green cabs. If you get into a yellow and green cab, $3.50 is already accounted for. And if you have to cross into one of the other boroughs, that's $6.15 that you have to account for um, the toll. So before you even get in the cab and go anywhere, you have to account for $9.65. So you're relying on $5.35 to travel from Queens to Manhattan. And 
uh, where you're going to travel for $5.35. Uh, outside of that, you're going to have to cover the uh, remaining costs. So the average number of $15 per ride is actually ridiculous. Um, Boston's system, like Keith stated himself, is $40, and they use you know, regular Via, Lyft, and Uber, um, and they cover up to $42. So it, it, limiting the system to 16 rides per month and $15, you're completely destroying the program, and you're going to shift the members from the yellow and green cabs back to the blue and whites, which cost $85 per ride. So uh, it, it's kind of counterintuitive. Uh, I think a better solution would be round trip per day, $50 per ride. That would give the average consumer you know, a real opportunity to use the system and go travel to and work, um, to and from work and you know, recreational and, and use it however they want. Yeah, at least, and if they have additional ride needs, they can use the traditional, you know, blue and whites. So, that's it. Thank you. We still have a couple of panelists, so if we could keep to the two-minute rule, we don't want to. We want to make sure that people are not here longer than they should be. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jean Ryan president of Disabled in Action. It seems that every time something is working better in Access Ride and they are providing more meaningful service, ridership and number of trips go up. Uh-oh. They must say to each other, they don't want increased ridership because they say it's too expensive. Never mind that people with disabilities have to get places to work and school and medical care and social events or whatever. Nope. They want to stop this from happening, so what can they do to reduce and discourage ridership this time? Last time they instituted in-person testing, lowered appeals, success rate, and then they put a lot of people on feeder service, whereby excess ride riders would be driven to a bus stop or a train station for the rest of their trip. Never mind that there was no shelter or the trip took extra long or the person could not ride without a seat. Not their problem. Many people get, got so discouraged because they could not get places that they didn't even reapply for Access Ride when it was time. And at meetings, I would hear people from Access Ride say, hmm, a lot of people didn't reapply. I wonder why. Fast forward to 2019, the MTA has a popular taxi pilot program which allows people with disabilities, us, to call a cab and take rides spontaneously without having to book trips a day in advance and try to guess when we will need transportation, when the city council hearing or meeting or doctor appointment or concert will be over, when we need, or, uh, <clears throat> when we need plans to allow, only allow 16 trips per month and we'll pay only $15 per trip, guess what? That will have the same effect that the feeder service had on people with disabilities. It will again make us stuck in our homes and doing way less because we cannot get around quickly or spontaneously the same day. We're be being punished for having a disability and for wanting to be productive. Who is the sick one? The MTA. We want to be able to take same-day cab rides so we can be productive and accomplish things. We do not want to cap on distance or amount or on number of trips. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Ring. I'm with Disabled in Action. Hi, my name is uh, Michael Ring. I'm with Disabled in Action. I would say I'm one of the lucky 1,200 who got into the pilot program, but it wasn't luck. I was picked because I'm one of the people who can give feedback. There was a waiting list of active people who the MTA wanted feedback from. I was told about it by a friend who's going to the Olympics in June. He's, gonna, he's a blind athlete who's running the marathon. They picked active people who use the service a lot. I was probably one of the people who went from four rides a month to 50 or 60 because the old system was useless to me. It got me to the doctor either an hour and a half early or right on time, and it, would, you know, it was a day killer. And now I can volunteer, I'm looking for a job, it is something that's useful to me. Uh, a $15 cap is a, is, doesn't do anything. I live in Brooklyn, 
$15 doesn't get me to Manhattan where my doctors are. It doesn't get me to where I volunteer. Um, they're clearly trying to sabotage the program by making it useless. Um, as, uh, if they're having an experiment, which this is what, what this is, they should change one variable. Add 1,200 people who wa aren't super active people. You know, put my mother-in-law in it, who's, you know, teach her how to use an app and see if she's going to use it and how often she uses it. You know, people like that, and st and as opposed to people like me, and they'll see how she uses it. I also want to talk about two words that got thrown around here a lot today, um, life-changing and spontaneous. Um, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for this on-demand app. I can't go home by subway. My, my hands don't work. I can't hold that pole. Um, and I, no one knows when this meeting is going to end. So I, I have to use the app to get home. If it wasn't for the app, I'd be walking to Park Slope. So that's life-changing, that I could be here. It's not like I want to go see the sunset, like the spontaneous thing. It's that kind of spontaneity is what normal people do. Thank you. Oh, sure. That's good? That's good? Okay, perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just uh, thank you for uh, having this opportunity to speak to the council and everyone here. And I share uh, my testimony with my brothers and sisters. And if one thing we see in a disabled population in the community is that we have diversity. We don't have to work and try to make it happen. It just, we all face different challenges in life and we overcome them. And mine is a visual impairment. I am a teacher of the visually impaired, and I'm a chap leader. I work for the UFT as a rep, and I represent teachers. And I've been an accessor ride patron for the last 20 years, and the last two have been the most successful for me. The last four years, I've been a chapter leader and have to make quick changes in my schedule when I get a message from a member saying, I'm being called in for a disciplinary meeting. Or even as a consultant for technology, I'm an adaptive technology specialist. Somebody tells me this is not working. Can you come and help me? And I'm not going to the doctor. All of us who are disabled don't live typical lives. We're not typical. We're human beings. I'm a father. I have five children at home. I own a home. I pay my taxes. I'm contributing to society. My students, their parents tell me, thank you for getting out there and living your life and showing us that we can have a life. My child can have a life with a visual impairment. So I'm asking, this is a win-win, and I'm asking the council. The MTA is asking for more money. So what if the city puts up a little bit more and supports the cabbies, the yellow and the, and the greens, who are having trouble with Uber and, 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 and Lyft, and even maybe even expand the program. But if we're getting citizens out paying good money for services, and contributing to the, to, to the infrastructure, I think it's, I think it, it's just a win-win for everyone. And this would help the program. I'm hearing, uh, like, my, like my colleagues here, uh, or, or uh, fellow uh, riders are saying, it's, it's, it's sort of a sabotaging system. We're getting more time, we're getting more uh, vehicles. They're willing to pay $85, throw good money after bad, or through, you know, the idea being that they're going to invest in that old broken system, but when broker services don't work and we have new services at the same average, the cabs are costing them the same as the broker. They'll invest in the brokers, but they won't invest in the cabs. So add the 1,200, and, and like, like my brother here said, let's see what happens. Why, broke some, why break something that finally is working? Thank you for my time. Thank you for your time. My name is Vincent Padula. Thank you, Thank you Vincent. Uh, my girlfriend, Jessica, she uh, is a participant of the pilot program, and she doesn't take advantage of the system. Since she's joined the system, she started working and uses the system in inclement weather and uses the subway. And she rolls from 29th to 14th Street because that's the next of, um, available subway station with an elevator. And she takes that into Brooklyn and sometimes get stuck in the system because where she gets off at, um, the elevator goes out a lot. So those are the situations that um, I guess she has to face, you know, going to and from work. And if it wasn't for the pilot program and working for disability rights organizations, she would not be able to work. So, you know, 
that's where that life changing you know yeah. thing comes in understood thank you guys for coming today thank you so much uh is there a lucia um lucia were you here we missed you okay um denise richardson helene schwarzenberger uh sasha blair golden goldenson daniel ross and jackie cohen We called you, Lucia. You missed us. <laughs> Can't find the mic. <laughs>
and they have to improve in tandem. And frankly, as Kathleen said, it will not improve until we, we are represented in the room where these decisions happen, which is the MTA boardroom. We all know the story, the, the governor controls the show, but the mayor can do a lot, and I believe that you guys have some traction with the mayor. Tell him he has two open vacancies that he hasn't nominated. Get people with disabilities in that room, so at the very least when they make these decisions, like cutting back on e -hail, there's someone in the room to hold their feet to the fire and say, no, that's wrong. We can't vote it down because we don't have the, the votes yet. But at the very least, we can make sure our voices are in the conversation. So please, please talk to the mayor, do what we can to get our representation there so we don't have another 30 years of this. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jackie Cohen, um, and I'm with the Strap Hangers Campaign, a writer's advocacy group. And I'll, I'll make my remarks brief. Um, I, I don't think I can articulate any better um, our uh, support of the on-demand pilot program than um, other fellow advocates here have. You've heard from folks that have taken the service and called it life-changing. We've heard the same. Um, we're deeply concerned with the rollback of this program. Um, you've heard that the MTA plans to expand it to another 1,200 riders while significantly gutting the, the pilot. Um, this can be a real opportunity for the MTA to get something right, and we think that it can, by, by achieving better paratransit service, the MTA can provide a shining example to other cities throughout the country what paratransit service can look like. Um, in addition to what all our fellow advocates said, I want to um, bring up one additional point, is that the fair payment system, there, there is no fair payment system with Accessoride. Riders are expected to pay in cash, and this is a problem not simply because of convenience. Um, there's a real inequity equity here. Paratransit riders aren't eligible for the same kind of fare payment discounts that many other riders are on subways and buses. And so this extends to weekly and monthly metro cards. And you heard from riders here that are taking more than 47 paratransit trips per month. Um, that is the number, that is sort of the cap that in which the unlimited uh, trip goes into effect. Um, and riders are not eligible for fair fare. So low income accessor riders, because the program is administered through metro cards, these riders do not have access to that program. And that's really concerning to us. Um, so we think that in addition to paratransit being included in the rollout of Omni, the new fare payment system, the city needs to come up with some kind of way to make sure that accessor riders aren't being exempt from fare fares because over, almost 100,000 New Yorkers have already enrolled. Open enrollment starts in January and we would like to see accessor riders a part of that. Thank you. Yes, I am in favor of keeping the on-demand program as it is. Do not add caps on how many rides we can take and do not limit the amount of money the MTA will cover. And also the other thing is, you got 16% of disabled people, 16% above poverty level. With the on-demand program, a lot of disabled people were able to work. Now what's gonna be? They're not gonna be able to work because they're not gonna have the pile program. If you wanna save some money, what you got to do, okay, is cut the recertification program every five years. People don't need to be recertified, give them continuous eligibility to insinuate and to imply that a person disability might change is insulting. That's insulting to say that. We have disability pride. We are here to be treated with dignity and with respect. What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! Thank you. And what is your name, ma'am? My name is Lucia. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Somebody say yay. Yay. My name is Helene Schwarzenberger. I appear today as an individual person who is disabled, and uh, though I'm loath to admit it, elderly as well. And as the executive director of the Association for Applied for uh, the rights of disabled consumers. <clears throat> I'm going to speak on three issues that others have slightly touched on, I'm grateful they did. Uh, I don't mind using Accessory as it stands. I'm not lucky enough to be in the on-demand program. I would like, it, like to see 
uh, some percentage of the on-demand be allowed for every writer. But barring that, I think that the costs of the on-demand are perhaps higher than the one for Accessoride because Accessoride fails and refuses to reimburse people for their taxi authorizations. And they discriminate against people with visual disabilities, which I am one, That's right. uh, because I can't check to see if the taxi driver, the cab driver, the car service driver is giving me a receipt that's properly filled out. Every single time I've submitted my taxi receipts, they've de declined it. So I'm out hundreds of thousands of dollars because I, didn't, I wasn't able to get reimbursed. And now I have two days to prepare my taxi authorization receipts and I have nobody to help me. Uh, so the whole issue of taxi authorizations may be putting money in the coffers of Accessoride because they're failing to re re uh, reimburse people, but I feel that that's discriminatory and against the ADA. That's right. Secondly, uh, the drivers, some of them don't even speak English. So I'm not talking about Accessoride drivers, but I mean car service drivers. So the MTA should require any uh, persons or companies that are licensed to drive in the city of New York, that they be, their drivers be able to read, write, and speak English. Uh, third, they should require them to have paper receipts so they can give them and fill them out properly, not just you know hand the person a paper receipt that's improperly filled out. And I guess I've used up my time, but basically um, the whole taxi authorization plan could work very well if these changes were made. Thank you. Thank you, Helene. Um, if there's anything that we can help you with those receipts, any way that we can be helpful, let me know after the hearing. I will, I will let you know. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll summarize my remarks. I'm Denise Richardson from the Citizens Budget Commission. And we've heard a great deal today about the value of the Accessoride program and particularly the on-demand program. And in your remarks, Council Member, you did talk about the challenge becoming how to pay for this. And so in my brief time, I'd like to point out some cost factors that I think we should all be aware of as we look at expanding Accessoride and making it more efficient because it is such a vital service. In 2017, the Accessoride program provided six million rides at a cost of $474 million. Fare revenue from the Accessoride passengers was $17.5 million, and the, city's, and the city paid $134 million toward the operating deficit. In 2018, the city's share was $150 million. This year, it's projected to be $173 million. By 2023, at the end of this, at the end of the uh, projected MTA financial plan, the projection is that the city's share would be 199 million, and that's at the current fair sharing, um, the revenue, sh the cost sharing formula. The MTA has requested that the city increase its share of the cost to 50 percent. By 2023, what this means is that the city would have cumulatively owed $361 million from 2020 to 2023. I'm not arguing that this isn't a vital service, but as you all acknowledge today, the challenge will be how we continue to pay for this and how we make the program more cost effective to serve the needs of the riders. But in fact, this is a significant change in, the, in cost, and it's something that needs to be considered in the budget. Thank you. Thank you. If I sit here, does it get picked up enough? Is that good? Okay. So my name is Daniel Ross. I'm a senior staff attorney at Mobilization for Justice, which is a member of the Accessoride Reform Group known as ARG. Accessoride's on-demand pilot program is life-changing for people with disabilities who cannot ride the bus or the subway. Many Accessoride users have been told for decades, both by the MTA and city officials alike, that their transit needs are just too expensive. Now, with the rollout of a program that actually gets them where they need to go, they're being told the same thing. But it's not too expensive. In 2018, the cost of the on-demand program was a little less than $9 million. And this year, now that usage has plateaued, the MTA expects the pilot to cost about $15 million. That's affordable, and the program is important. But the MTA has announced severe trip and distance caps for the on-demand pilot that, at a maximum, will cost half of what it cost this year. But it's unlikely to cost that much because 
$15 on a taxi meter doesn't get you very far, it gets you about two miles. A $15 cab ride doesn't get you to Manhattan Central Business District unless you already live there. So it doesn't get you to work. It doesn't get you to your school. It doesn't get you to the city's major medical centers. In Brooklyn, it barely gets you from one side of Prospect Park to the other. The MTA doesn't limit anyone else's trips like this, and it shouldn't turn this life-changing service into an irrelevance. The current participants were the first in line motivated users. Even those who didn't use the service before were people who signed up because they saw how great it would be. Even so, the av they average less than one trip per day. An expanded pilot to measure costs with a representative sample of accessoried users based on age, past usage, and geographic distribution is needed to project costs and to plan for future expansion. We expect, and the MTA I think agrees, that our proposal for a phase two of the pilot would cost between 23 and $33 million. That's 5% of Accessoride's annual budget and a minuscule amount in the city's budget. You can find more details in the finances in our written testimony. In conclusion, I'll say that the continuation and expansion of the pilot without artificial caps on rise and distance is critical to participants who rely on it and is essential to building tomorrow's paratransit system. This program is worth your investment. Please support it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next panel is Frederica, um, I'm sorry, Bapler, Edith Francis, Jean Pedula, Iman Rumaru, Rumari, and Liferni Andrews. Liferni Andrews, sorry. Good afternoon, Chairs Ayala Chin and other city council members. Thank you for holding an important hearing on Accessoride. My name is Iman Ramawi, and I'm from New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Since 2017, I have been using Accessoride's on demand pilot program to commute to a full time job, to healthcare appointments, to social events with my family, friends, and my partner. I also use traditional Accessoride, for which I have to book a trip one day or more in advance. While there are bumps and snags in the pilot program, such as a small number of taxis and wheelchair accessible taxis in the outer boroughs, there is a huge difference between the two programs, and I truly hope that an on-demand service is in the future of paratransit. With a traditional service, it is impossible for me to know whether my trips will take up to an hour or more. I've been on for six hours. That's the longest I've been on Access Ride. And I don't know how many other riders um, we don't, we'll pick up. Sometimes there's one more, sometimes there's four or five more. Or how many will get dropped off before me, possibly in other boroughs or other neighborhoods far from my route, which happens often. When I use this service, I am routinely late for work, despite having to wake up at 6 a.m. most mornings to catch a ride. And I tell you, having lupus, that makes it hard to wake up that early every single day. Um, and I can't alter my schedule to accommodate these meetings, events, or even impromptu gatherings with colleagues and friends. The on-demand pro pro pilot program has changed all of that and could truly be liberating for paratransit riders like me. Our coalition, ARG, has three simple demands to ensure the survival and success of the on-demand service over time. 
gradually expand the number of riders who can participate in the on-demand pilot. Eventually, all access ride users should have access to on-demand, but to allow the MTA to plan for the expansion, the program needs a representative sample of the access ride community to achieve a proportional mix of high, medium, and low frequency users, riders of different ages and geographic distributions across the boroughs. Two, do not impose artificial limits on the number of trips or lengths of those trips. And for example, I saw how much an on-demand trip took me from our office on 43rd and 6th to my pharmacy on 39th and 3rd, and that was $15.30. So that's not gonna take me anywhere if I have to go farther than that, and that was not during rush hours in the afternoon. Some might need longer trips, some might need shorter trips, and we need a variety of them. Imposing caps and limits before accurately measuring the true need for and the cost of the on-demand program is just a constraint on people with disabilities excluded from buses and subways. And three, work with the drivers and vendors to ensure that on-demand service is available throughout the city. For on-demand service to be truly successful, it needs to be available across the boroughs, which means having sufficient <laughs> vehicles. And I can't use on-demand that much because I'm in Throgs and in the Bronx and I'd have to wait over an hour to get a ride. So I use traditional access ride probably 70% of the time and I'm still late for everything and I'm still on the buses for a long amount of time and I still have to wait two or three or four hours for my ride. So either way, whether I'm using on demand or using traditional, it doesn't work for me simply because I work, live all the way out in the Bronx and I have metal legs and that's just not fair and that's not right. Also, the Manage My Trip app does not work the way it's supposed to, and I love how they said it's awesome and it's great, except most of the time it's not accurate, you can't really track your trips, it crashes all the time and doesn't work the way it's supposed to, and it's, it's kind of terrible. And lastly, I'll say that I spend about $400 a month to use Accessoride because we're not part of fair fares and we can't use Metro cards, and it's not fair to me as a taxpayer, regardless of whether I'm a taxpayer or not, it's not fair to me to have to pay $400 a month to just go to work, and mind you, $350 is four trips a day. So if it's 400, it's maybe six trips a day, and most days, I do have that for my meetings all over the city. And that's not fair and that's not right to me as a taxpayer and as a customer for the MTA. So thank you so much. And um, I look forward to hearing the rest of the people. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Frederica Bepler. I'm an intern at Live On New York and a graduate student in social work at Fordham University. I'm a lifelong New Yorker and also a caregiver for an elderly parent. Uh, Live on New York's members include more than 100 community-based organizations that provide more than 1,000 programs to serve older New Yorkers. Uh, I'm gonna append my testimony just because of the time. Um, I just wanna affirm the fact that Accessoride users deserve the dignity of a transit system that meets their needs. Um, we think that the eHale program is great. We think it should be expanded and that its funding should be made permanent. Um, but we think that the $15 subsidy is wrong. Um, it runs counter to the needs of the population that Accessoride is meant to serve, disabled and elderly New Yorkers who cannot afford to regularly hire cabs or drivers. In Pat Foy's letter to the mayor about Accessoride, he stated that the new subsidy mirrors subsidies in cities like Boston, Chicago, and DC, but all three of those cities have something in common that New York City does not. They have accessible subway systems. In Chicago, the subway system is 67% accessible. In Boston, it is 74% accessible. In DC, it is 100% accessible. In New York City, it is 24% accessible. A longtime employee from our benefits outreach program recently underwent ankle surgery and experienced Accessoride and eHale for the first uh, first hand. She called the eHale program perfect and the best thing ever, and said that she found her rides to be convenient, well organized, and efficient. But when she used traditional Accessoride, she described disorganized rides and vans that were often filled to capacity, showed up late, and would take her far out of her way. In one instance, driving from Manhattan up past her neighborhood in the West Bronx into the East Bronx before doubling back to drop her off. She said that many people she knows refers to it as a stressor ride. Given the divergent experiences between a traditional Accessoride and the new eHeal program, expanding on-demand eHeal and establishing its permanency should be a priority for the city and the agency. 
Um, I'll just also take a moment to recognize that um, council members Valone and Ku came together to provide transportation service for older adults living in Easter Queens by providing discretionary funds to Live On's member self-help community services, and that that has been a great pro program for that community, and the users have raved about it. So there is a potential for funds for community-based organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Laferne Andrews. I'm a project director at Catholic Charities Brooklyn and Queens for a new initiative they embarked on about two years ago called the St. John 23rd Senior Services. On behalf of Catholic Charities Brooklyn and Queens, I represent a vast majority of the 22,000 seniors we serve across Brooklyn and Queens who utilize Access to Ride. During the latter half of 2019, we embarked on the initiative to create three advocacy councils, one in Brooklyn and two in Queens, where seniors are involved in advocating for things that improve their quality of life. At the first meeting, the Brooklyn group started discussing different activities they would like to get involved in. And one theme keep coming up over and over, issues with access to rights. So we decided that we are going to embark on an, on an initiative to petition access to ride because most of them describe the service as being horrible and unreliable. Seniors across Brooklyn and Queens have complained about the tardiness in service, often having to request transportation via access to ride to pick them up at least an hour before their actual time to leave to ensure timely arrival. There are numerous instances when transportation shows up late, an hour, two hours, or three hours, with a number of calls made to the base to inquire about the arrival of their transportation, many times having to wait outside, sometimes in the cold. Instances were also described that transportation via access arrive may not show up at all, leaving seniors stranded and having to cancel important appointments with difficulty of rescheduling on a date sooner rather than later. There are so many stories. A lady from Howard Beach who is in a wheelchair was dropped off by an access to ride van equipped for a wheelchair, but when it was time to pick her up, she got a taxi, which she had difficulties getting into and very uncomfortable trying to get home. This is not an isolated situation. Many of our seniors express so many stories, horror stories about their experience with ac access to ride. Seniors re also report that their complaints are usually not taken seriously by access to ride. And at times, patrons feel retaliated against when they call to complain, quote unquote, too often. One senior came to one of our meetings in Queens and she talked about how she was retaliated against by a dispatcher in Queens for having a certain tone. The Advocacy Council of Brooklyn Queen and Queens are working tirelessly to obtain signatures for a petition against access to ride, and they are connecting with partners to assist in drawing awareness to the efforts of our seniors to bring about change in customer service, dispatch, operations, and other areas that impact the overall quality of service that Access Arrive provides to its page patrons. We're gonna need you to wrap up, if you could summarize. Yes. Um, we solicit the support of this body to represent and assist us in holding Access Arrive accountable and to take steps that would require Access Arrive to significantly improve the services for their pa patrons. Access to Ride is a much needed service for our seniors and improvements need to be made. Our seniors demand change and they intend to effect change for all who currently use Access to Ride and potential users of Access to Ride. Catholic Charities of Brooklyn and Queens is committed to the efforts of our advocacy <coughs> councils and support the efforts of our seniors in demanding better service for Access to Ride. Thank you. Come on. All right. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Padula, and I'm a supervisor with the Department of Education. Uh, specifically, I work with uh, Educational Vision Services. We are the department that provides 
services to over 750 blind and low vision students um, throughout the five uh, boroughs. And I'm here today, first thing I wanna say is I, I just, it's important to realize that nobody should ever mistake disability for inability. And within the legally blind community itself, we are faced with a 70% unemployment rate. And a major barrier to unemployment is transportation. And this is why it is so important that Accessoride not only evolve, but it's got to be viable. And it's got to afford disabled citizens the same autonomy and access to opportunity as every other citizen in this city. And Accessoride has been an absolute debacle since the inception of the eHale program that afforded us that autonomy. Traditional trips, we know the numbers, everybody's been saying them, $80 a trip. Carriers were making piles and piles of cash on the backs of marginalized, disabled New Yorkers. Curb trips, $36 a trip. So I don't know where the MTA is getting their math, but $36 is less than half than $80. I taught high school math for 10 years, just saying. Um, I lost my spot here. I'm trying to summarize too, I'm just skipping around. So yeah, they're complaining that the e-hail program is too expensive because people are booking too many trips. Yeah, well, because it works. And the data is biased because it wasn't a random sample. 1,200 users, highly motivated, power users. And what are we basing this data on? What are we basing this decision on? Bad math? So the bottom line here is we need to enable our city's disabled. And as I am asking that city council support this, but what is the city gonna get for their money? So you guys do put your money behind this. I hope that number one, um, the money does go to on-demand e-hail service because it's supporting your taxi fleet. And number two, is the Accessoride Command Center, is it accessible? Do we have any disabled people working there? Are my blind children gonna get jobs? I hope my blind kids get jobs there. That'd be nice too. So uh, I'd like the city to support it, yes, for us, for our transportation, but the city should be making a good investment in as, as well. Because um, at the end of the day, wouldn't it be nice to have a, some more contributing taxpayers? Thanks, thank you, thank you for your time. My name is John Padula. Hello, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Edith Prentice. I am the chair of the Taxes for All campaign, which as you all have heard us testify about, is the only thing that's made this program work. In the days when we had two taxis, four taxis that were accessible, there was no feature in this. I have only applied for Accessoride and have applied three times because I always fall off when it comes to the research time when I'm leaving rehab. I live in Washington Heights, which amazingly enough has pretty good accessibility to the subway, at least on the A, and we have one stop on the one. We have seven, seven stations with 15 elevators and one escalator that are completely being redone. But not a single one of those stations is accessible other than the dead escalator. Uh, and it's really important that when we start talking about accessoride usage that we realize that we also have to look at the distribution of these elevators. How many people in the community would use the subway if they could? I have on more than one occasion gotten to 170 7th Street, and the elevator's out. You know what? I call curb. I don't have time to play around. I don't have time to wheel to 168th Street. I know better than to waste my time. It's really important to also question the legal ramifications 
of $15.16 trips. Is that equivalent service? Every lawyer I've asked sort of goes, yeah, no. Um, how can the MTA decide to do this? We all agree it's a major problem, but you know what? Maybe the MTA needs to look at where it's putting its apples in baskets. I personally use accessory on either I'm, I'm very sick, my chair is very sick, or it's I have no idea where I'm going. For a friend's funeral in the far reaches of the outlands of Brooklyn, I know that was at least $130 one way. I managed to figure out getting back by mass transit. When the, uh, when the mayor did his executive order, we were in the far reaches of Brooklyn. That was another killer ride. And from, from to Broadway to 186th Street was over $100. And I only did that because I was having an asthma attack. Who is going to be able to pay this? hundred. It was like $120. It certainly is going to cost more if I call um, EMS. It's an unrealistic expectation for any of us to be able to use that. And I have to tell you that accessory runs better than my train, than my, my bus service. If I need to get to the emergency room at one in the morning, Buses don't run up Broadway. Thank you, Edith. Thank you so much. It's fun. Thank you. I understand. I get it. Thank you, guys. Next panel, Frank Sr., Maritza Flores, Jessica Murray, CN, uh, Taria, uh, Taria Mitchell, and Ray Wayne. This will be our final panel. Thank you. Thank you, John. Me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon. I'm Ray Wayne. I'm with the National Federation of the Blind New York City chapter. Um, I want to I want to hit on the on time issue. I don't know where they got this number, but the MTA said that their on time performance rate is it for this is for traditional access right is ninety seven percent. Even if that number is correct, a person who works 
and uses excessive ride every day, five days a week, would be late to work once a month. That's 12 times a year. Well, I don't think I'd keep my job if I were late for work 12, 12 times a year. And that doesn't even take into account the 30 minute window, which is the driver can be 30 minutes late and that still counts as being on time. Um, I won't go through what people have said about EHEL. We support it, it needs to be expanded, it needs to be used without any cap. It would cost, if, if I were working at my last full-time job, it would cost $25 each way to go to and from work with EHEL. Um, also, taxi authorizations should not be restricted to, uh, you have to, to get a taxi authorization, you have to be traveling within the same borough. So if someone who lives in Brooklyn or Queens and ride doesn't show and they need to get, sorry, I didn't do it. Sorry, one second. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad they're telling me there's a snowstorm. I would have figured it out. <laughs> Someone needing to get to work and having their ride not show from one of the outer boroughs to Manhattan can't, can't get a taxi authorization. They need to be citywide. Um, and I touched some other issues in our written testimony. Um, again, I don't want to take up time repeating things that other people have already said, but I think the system needs to be fixed. EHAL is a solution, it, and it, it needs to be upgraded and not have limitations placed on it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Frank, uh, my name is Frank Senior and I'm a sightless uh, jazz vocalist here in the city. And I, I had uh, a speech all ready for you and everything, but I forgot it by now. But I'm here to say that I'm a prime example of unemployment going down because of this uh, same day uh, on-demand taxis. I gig at night, and I can't tell you how many times I've been left behind after the clubs are closed, stranded in the snow, waiting for a ride, lonely, dangerous. I'm telling you, uh, I can accept same day gigs, uh, different nursing homes. Uh, I can socialize with my coworkers after work if I want to. And if I'm home, just knowing that I have this on-demand taxi, if I'm home, it's because I want to be there, not because I have to be here. It, it makes me appreciate that even more. This same day taxi thing has changed my life huge way. And to put this cap on this, this $15 cap, you, you're just really telling the program goodbye. It's ridiculous. So uh, all we want and all we're talking about is the right to freedom. That's what you people take for granted. We're just talking about to be able to come and go as we please. What's wrong with that? I don't see nothing wrong with that. I'm just telling you, please, please find it. When you go to work after, uh, or you go to dinner after you leave here to talk about this, at least you can do that. The people that are on this accessoride thing, that's just a dream to them. This same day taxi, has made a huge difference in our community. We have pride, we have dignity, and uh, let's keep it that way, please. I plead with you. Thank you. Hi there, everyone. Um, what hasn't been said is that uh, what cost the MTA so much money with the uh, paratransit is insurance administration costs and the price of fuel and I do believe if the MTA was to switch to electric buses for their bus fleet um, that would really save them a lot of money um, because uh, you know the price of fuel is, you know it's very expensive 
And um, the on-demand uh, taxi service uh, saves them so much money because they're not paying the drivers uh, their fuel costs um, or even a wage. They're just reimbursing for the uh, price of the ride. And I am concerned that the MTA is focusing on um, the wrong issues when it comes to their budget. They're going to spend $249 million on 500 police officers in the uh, subway system. There's 469 subway stations, over 6,000 uh, trains that are, you know, are traveling in the system on a 24-hour cycle. And um, I just don't understand how 500 police officers is going to able to prevent crime from happening. What would prevent crime from happening is cameras in the train cars, such as in the Chicago transit uh, system, which cost them $14 million, which is a lot less, and uh, help them to uh, um, actually, um, they were able to arrest 1,380 something um, offenders between 2011 and uh, 2017 because of those cameras that are in the system. They have 32,000 surveillance cameras in the Chicago Transit Authority and we hardly have any in the New York City subway system. No wonder crime is uh, you know, so prolific. So like I said, 500 cops is gonna do nothing. That money should be spent on the paratransit. Uh, system and uh, so should the five billion dollars that is earmarked to make these subway systems accessible because it's really hard to make such an ancient uh, system to be accessible. It's just I, I think nearly impossible um, to do that architecturally. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maritza Flores, and I wanted to say that this pilot program has been a very helpful um, thing to use. It has helped me out a lot and I think it would be important for it to improve and to not be limited. <laughs> That's about it. Thank you, Maritza. Hello, my name is Jessica Murray. Um, I'm not a paratransit user, uh, but I'm a researcher. I'm a PhD candidate at CUNY, and I've been studying transportation accessibility issues for the last seven years. Um, and you know, I'm here today to kind of talk about um, the MTA's uh, financial reasoning behind why they cut the the larger. Um, advanced reservation program. Um, I kind of looked a little bit close, more closely at their presentation from April after the program had ended, and it seems like um, they kind of forgot to mention the fact that the traditional carrier service trips um, increased by about 11 to $12 per trip over the course of one year. Um, and then, you know, now they say the, that the budget keeps going up. Um, th there was also a, a, about a $40 million increase in the administrative costs um, this year. So while, you know, there are um, some reasons to be concerned about, um, you know, expanding this program in a fiscally responsible manner, I think that they've kind of been misrepresenting the facts. And so um, I've given you uh, my analysis so you can kind of see why, um, why I came to my own conclusions. I'm using um, the only real information that's available, which is on their dashboard that shows the number of trips per carrier type and compared it to the numbers that they presented in April and then earlier this week. Um, and so I think um, since they were using that rationale to justify ending this larger eHale program, um, it's really important to go back and look at that analysis a little bit more closely before determining caps um, on this other program. Um, so this idea of like, okay, 16 trips per month is the median usage. Um, you know, we'd, we'd, 
they won't really tell us like what the upper limit is, like what the, we know what the average is, it's around 30 trips per month. Um, they claim that, you know, usage is going up and up and up, but you can see the last six months on the dashboard where there's only the 1,200 eHealth participants, uh, where previously they had combined it with the larger eHealth program. And it's pretty flat, it's like around 30 trips per month. Um, I mean, you would obviously want a longer history to see what the trend is, but uh, generally, it's about 30, 30 trips per month. So I think um, basing it on the average uh, would still have the intended effect of reducing some of the usage without being so extreme. And also um, getting the facts from them about the actual um, average trip cost for that um, on-demand program is also information that we don't really have. So those are my only points. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Torea Mitchell. I'm not representing any organization per se, but I am an organizer, activist in the movement for black lives. And uh, contrary to fake news and rumors, we don't get George Soros money. We don't get any funding at all. So I'm basically a volunteer. Um, I'm gonna sh share my own, I didn't know if I wanted to share this, but I decided I might as well before um, I was assaulted uh, at, Atlant at Barclay Atlantic Avenue Station in July. I was pushed and shoved uh, by a, I don't know if how, how old she was, but I'm guessing it was like late 30s, early 40s uh, woman. And I was traumatized. I didn't want to take the subway because I felt it was a hate crime. People that observed it, you know, they asked me that, that I want to stay. And I'm like, you know, they asked one of the officers, it was their video, and they said yes. But after they took my ID and they ran my name, you know, I guess, you know, because of my group, I guess, is, um, if you haven't heard, is listed in S, uh, uh, SRG, and it was a FOIA request a few, uh, few years ago. My group was one of the groups that was targeted by, S, by uh, SRG. Um, so then I was surrounded by four or five male cops and the woman that assaulted me, she was a white woman, she, was, she had a, a female officer and she just had one officer with her. And even though it was clear from the bystander that she assaulted me, you know, I was told, I said, well, why don't you pull the video and you can see what happened. And they told me, well, if we have to pull the video, we're gonna arrest you and her. So I don't feel safe taking the subway. So for people that wanted to know about the uh, 500 more cops, yes, the MTA board did, did pass that budget this afternoon. I don't feel safe with the cops and I also don't feel safe with Accessorite because I was working for the city. I was a city worker for 12 years. I didn't use Accessorite because I would always, if I did, I would be late for work. And Fortunately for me, I had the luxury I could just take the bus home, and that's what I did. It wasn't a, a long commute. But now that I have a medical disability on top of my visual disability, I have to use Accessoride, but the thing is, I can't sit in those vehicles in, for a long amount of time. I can't sit in the vehicles for two and a half, three hours. And usually if you use Accessoride, at least for me, that's what I'm going to have to, that's what I have to do. I can recount Thanksgiving. This Thanksgiving, I was picked up to re go back home at seven o'clock. Eight o'clock, I was still on the bus, uh, the or the omnibus. The driver told me he had to wait 25 minutes, hold like till 8.25, 8.30 for another pickup after he had picked someone up and dropped them off already. So 8.30, I just told him, I, you know, I've been on the bus an, an hour and a half. I'm in so much pain. And I said, can you drop me at the nearest train station? So he called dispatch. He couldn't drop me at the nearest train station, so I had to just get out in the middle of Flatbush, Ditmus Park, Brooklyn. And uh, thank God I called my brother and he was able to direct me with, and some strangers helped me to the nearest train station. So I was able to get home, but the next week 
I was bed bound. So people have brought up the issue with Accessoride. Um, it is good when it works, but routing is not good. People with medical disabilities should not be on board a bus for two and three hours. It's not safe. It has the potential and it does harm us because we, also, we, we have unfortunate medical crises that occur because of that. So the routing has to be fixed. Also, people were talking about on-demand and e-hail. E-hail was a program that was for every Accessoride user where you can call a taxi the next day. They discontinued that service. Now they leave the on-demand and they're talking about adding 1,200 additional folks. Nobody knows how is that process made and why isn't the on-demand or percentage of it, as I said before, expanded to all of the other users? Why is it just a select few? It's a, it's a pilot program. Pilots usually take, what, a, a year or so? So that's also okay. violating the MDA. Uh, ADA. I want you to realize that accessibility Excuse and transportation me. is Excuse a civil me. right. It's okay. Transportation is a civil right. Understood. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the panelists for coming today. Please get home safely. It's going to be snowing, so be careful on the way out. Um, thank you for your testimony today. We have copies of everything. If you did not submit your written testimony, please feel free to email it to us for the record. Thank you, and this meeting is now adjourned.